Hi, my name is Aaron Mathias from Coraline Sporting Goods, and on this episode of Hunt Hard Talk Free, I've got Jeremy Evans, who is the co-author of Mauled, Lessons Learned from a Grizzly Attack. And this episode is brought to you by Ballistics Custom Turrets, which is the most accurate and affordable custom turret system on the market. I'm also going to throw a plug in for Badlands Apparel. Jeremy's going to get into why. So um, welcome to the podcast, Jeremy. It's it's an absolute pleasure having you on. And uh and I just wanted to start off with um, Steve Hogue. Tell me your relationship with Steve Hogue, who is the sales rep for Badlands. And how did you get involved with Badlands Apparel? Before we get into your harrowing story, let's let's get a little background on you. <laughs> well, that's a that's a great question. So I met Steve. It had to be at least seven eight years ago at a sporting goods uh, show in Calgary, Calgary Sportsman Show. And yep. at the time I was with uh, Pure Fishing and he was in there selling quantum rods and reels and he yep. started mentioning about Badlands packs. And when I was about 14, well, 14 years old, I purchased a Badlands pack to go sheep hunting and it was one of their demo packs a long time ago. When he was yep. talking about that, I got pretty excited. I'm like, hey, I like to you know get a Badlands pack and uh so we turned into a couple conversations. Uh, he handed me some pamphlets. And then the next day, I show up at the sportsman show. I'm like, hey, I like to order all this. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, wow, wh what's your plans? And uh, I had a hunt booked in Texas to go down to go uh, chase after some of the funky sheep that run around in western Texas. And yeah, I said, well, I'm going to go chase them, and I would like to try out this gear. Uh so he said, just leave it with me. And him and uh, Pat uh, was Pat was his uh, boss, or I guess they worked together. Yeah. Uh, bad Badlands. And he said, well, we'll talk and we'll give you a call in a day or so. Um, they came back to Calgary for another show and they invited me out. And sure enough, I had a, they set me up with a, what well, was a bunch of packs and suitcase a whole pile of gear well twice as much as what i what i expected <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was pretty surprising um the, it was two days after i got all this gear i didn't know what to do with it at first so i was reading up on it and go i'm gonna go try this out uh we had a whole bunch of sick of gear and you know i figured well let's give it a full shot yeah uh, hopped on a plane flew down to texas and I drug the gear behind the truck, uh, didn't wash it. I tried crawling, wrecking this, just tried destroying it basically. Yeah. And, it yeah well, and why not? Cause it's got unlimited lifetime warranty, right? Yeah. And I figured what the heck. So the, <laughs> I remember when the outfitter picked me up at the airport, I said, let's go to this, let's go to the store and grab a sandbag. And he's like, why? I'm like, I want to throw it in this pack and drag it behind the truck for a little bit and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and was that was that like a hard frame pack or was that just an internal frame or just a day pack it was their uh it was one of their internal frame packs uh yep. the oh i think it was sacrifice okay the well, sacrifice. you sacrificed it you sacrificed it i did and we we uh hit, we hit some of the gravel roads we tossed the pack and it you know with the rope tied onto it and drug it for at least five six miles and then we took one of <laughs> We took one of the jackets, filled it full of rocks and everything else, drug that behind the truck and yeah. just drove around. And I was like, wow, this is actually pretty good stuff. Well, let's be honest. I bet you destroyed both of those that you <laughs> drug behind the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly, they still, they came out pretty good. Uh, the pack had a little, a couple little holes in it, but overall it was, it was very well held together. Uh, during that hunt, I managed to shoot a, a pig, a sheep, and a goat all on one trip. Plus, I had a bunch of camera gear. I put yeah. the full the full pig inside the backpack. I just got it. It slid right in. Yeah. Then I shot a goat, parted that thing up, put that in the backpack. Yeah. And then I shot a sheep. Uh, so I had about, I'd say about 150 pounds in this backpack. Yeah. <laughs> so carrying it all out. And then uh, I shot a sheep on the way out, and it was didn't have enough room in the backpack. So I threw it on my shoulders and walking it out and to my surprise the pack actually never ripped apart it held together 
Uh, I was quite impressed. Do you know what species of sheep you were shooting down there? Uh, Corsican ram. And, okay. Uh, this is Spanish, some Spanish goats. The Spanish goats, yeah. I got one of them on the wall here at the store. Uh, they're beautiful. Do they stink as much as they say they stink? Oh, that was horrible. <laughs> you definitely know when you shoot a goat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, that's what I hear about those is they're one of the most disgusting creatures to harvest, just the scent of them. And it's just, they pee all over themselves as all animals do. I mean, that's part of the rut, but supposedly they are one of the stinkiest animals uh, to harvest for sure. You, you could definitely, you definitely know. So you don't need no tracking dog. You just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I got one other person I want to ask you about. And, uh, Helen Thomas. Helen Thomas used to work for Barton's in Grand Prairie, and she is now part of the management team of our Prince George Corlanes location. And she, uh, when, when I reached, or when Steve um, post, reshared your post on, um, when he reshared your post of your attack, I reached out to Steve immediately and said, I got to hear the story. I want to talk to this guy. I'd love to have him on to help him promote his book. Um, as when Robbie Austin and Chris Ayers both came in separately to do their, to tell their story of the exact same occurrence. They both had such different takeaways from it and, and they both remember the incident so differently. And, um, we had, I want to say it was one of the top five podcasts in Canada that month. And people like to hear stories like the one that uh, you're going to share with us today. And I got to say, you shot me a copy of the book, a digital copy, and I couldn't put it down. It was, it was absolutely riveting. And, and as somebody who spends a lot of time in the bush, I've been, I've slept in tents. I've been on 10 day sheep hunts. I've spent a lot of time in the mountains and in the back country, come across many bears in my time. I've hunted black bears with my bow, spring bear hunting. Um, never been on a grizzly hunt. They shut it down before I ever drew a tag here in BC, which we'll talk a little bit about that after we get through your story, if there's time. but. It was bone chilling. The reading through your story, reading through your personal account, uh, the co-author's account, your wife's journal, the doctor's records, not records, the doctor's telling more the technical side of your injuries that you sustained on this, um, on the, uh, we'll call it an adventure, but on this hellish survival uh, story. It's just, I, I, I couldn't stop reading it. And so, I mean, with my two and four year old at home, I don't have a whole lot of time to read books, but this one, after they went to bed, I was sitting down and scrolling through on my iPad, reading through the story. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. And, um, just to give it a little plug, when does your book release? What's the release date? Release date is September 27th. Perfect. And I know and I'll harass you off camera about this. I, I want to make sure that I've got some coming and because I think you shoot, shot me an email for somebody else that I'll be ordering through. If that's correct, I want these. I want to sell the living daylights out of them because uh, it is such a, a harrowing story. So we look forward to getting in both locations and we back you 100 percent and and love to promote um, local people and help get their stories out. And if anyone can learn something from it, that's to, to, to maybe save their lives or help somebody else who goes through similar attacks. Um, we need to share our stories, right? So let's, let's jump right into it. Oh, I, we, tell me about Helen. I, I kept talking. I didn't <laughs> let you talk. Tell me about your connection to Helen and how you got to know her. Well, I got to know Helen up at the Edmonton Sportsman Show. I was assigned to work in the Barton's booth to sell Badlands Badlands gear. I was their, I guess their pack expert. Um, I could be hit it off over a, a bucket of donuts and some lemonade. <laughs> nice. Doesn't get much <laughs> better than like, the buckets. No, it was kind of like my icebreaker, I guess. I'm like, hey, I'm Jeremy. I'm from Badlands. Here's some donuts. And what do you want me to do? <laughs> <laughs> Fair so, enough. She had a, a mountain of bino, uh, vinyl holders and well, a bunch of women's packs. And she's like, well, I don't know anything about these. How do you size somebody up and teach me a little bit about them? So we kind of hit it off that way there. Talked about a bunch of ah, hunting stories. It was a, it was a lot of fun. And then well, the following year is the year I got mauled by the bear. Okay. Uh, so that was, we had so much fun the time uh, the first year 
And she wanted me to come back again. And I told her, well, might not be able to because I got mauled, just recently mauled by a bear. And it's kind of still pretty fresh. Uh, so she was pretty much devastated. And then uh, talked to my wife and we decided, well, let's give it a shot. Um, of course, we hit it off again right away. We went over to the, uh, the Game Warren's booth and she was telling me about her spring bear hunt and or her fall bear hunt and then she's getting ready to go again in the spring and we're looking at the bears she was asking me if you know it made me nervous and what happened and well the first thing i did was i laid on the ground and eat the bear and i was like i was like yeah this is kind of what it was like when it was chewing on me <laughs> <laughs> damn like, you're in good spirits that. to be able to do that do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was just I was just laying and like quick get a picture. She's like, no, what are you doing? Like this is this is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and and I will say that really comes through in reading the book uh between the nurses' accounts, your wife's accounts, the author's accounts, is your sense of humor and your positivity through it all and how you with your thumbs up, with the jokes you'd be telling, with the your ability to get up and walk 60 feet or 60 meters down to the nurse's office instead of to the edge of the bed, which is what they were hoping for. Your your positivity seems to be one of the things that helped get you through, for sure. So before we get into the full story, I got a technical question for you. What were you packing yeah. for a rifle on this on this hunt? I was packing a 300 wind bag and my compound bow. Both. <laughs> Both, yeah. Most uh, guys are cutting their toothbrush in half to save a little weight on a sheep hunt. And here you are packing a bow and a rifle. <laughs> yeah. I had a uh, roughly about a hundred and about a hundred pounds of gear. I was yep. ready for uh well, four or five days. Okay. Well, let's get into the story. I'm, I, I could talk for days as you probably already found out, but what I want to do is I want to let you start telling the story. And then when I have questions, I'm going to jump in. All righty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's a, it's an interesting one. Uh, I started off, uh, I know this area quite well. I've been hunting back in there for 17 years. And the, actually the very first time I went out there was with my girlfriend, now my wife. We, uh, hiked way back in, way back in there into this canyon where nobody goes. I tried to get, there was guides out there. So I tried to get past the guides and keep going way back in just for, I just like the peace and quiet and nobody around. Yeah. Uh, we got back in there, hiked down the same trail. Uh, where this is the first time I've ever been down the trail. We ran into two grizzly bears. Uh, one ran in front of us about five, six feet away and stood up. And another one stood up on the other side of the trail and grunted and made some funky noises. And then they took off. Well, that was our <laughs> very first experience back in there. And a little <laughs> bit of a scary one. Yeah. We, uh, we still ended up staying there overnight. Um, got up next morning, seen some sheep, but not a whole lot around. There was those two bears stuck around for the whole time. So we got pretty nervous and decided to take off. Now, and for, fast, sorry, for anyone that's unaware of where we're speaking, we're talking Southern Alberta because we, we have listeners all around the world. Um, but we're talking Southern Alberta and, and we don't have to get into specifics. Um, and, and, and it's easily accessible for the first bit, right? And other, there, there's a fair amount of other people that can access the entry to the area. Well, the first, uh, off of the forestry trunk road is about, uh, 25 kilometers and the road gets pretty sketchy, washed out in areas. Yeah. Uh, at the, there's a gate where you have to park where you walk in, but the first, I'm going to say five, six kilometers, it's a road, old right. well road. Uh, they take, now it's all been closed down for a while. Now they use wagons. Uh, to take in hunters but after the five kilometers it goes into all washed out a creek washed everything out um it goes another 10 15 kilometers straight back to the hard rock there's multiple drainages and bowls you can hike into from there um it after about the seven eight k mark there's nobody even the outfitters don't like going that far back in um the nice. one canyon that I, that I used to go in all the time, they called it Crying Canyon because it's just a nasty, <laughs> nasty spot. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I actually shot a moose back in that canyon. Well, I think it's my third year hunting in there, and that was not a fun adventure trying to get that sucker out on foot. 
if there's one animal I wouldn't want to shoot in the middle of nowhere where it's tough to get in, it's a moose. <laughs> they're big, they're awkward, they're heavy. You're pack even if just to pack the head and antlers out in one pack, there's a lot of weight going on there, and then you can harvest a lot of meat off a of moose. You can, and I, I was uh, I was dumb and shot a bullwinkle because I thought it was cool. <laughs> Were you by yourself on the moose trip? I was by myself. It took me uh, three and a half days to hike that sucker out. Holy. Okay. Yeah. You're like eating as much as you can just so you don't have to pack it out. <laughs> How much moose can I, I eat in it. two days? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there was no mountainside to push it down. <laughs> it was just taking mini, uh, it was just basically like leapfrog and it take a chunk in, walking it out, say 500 yards, go back in another piece, walk it past the first one and just Holy. leapfrog and it constantly all day and night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I have lots of lots of uh, lots of fun experiences back in that canyon. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you said what? Fifteen years? You'd been back and forth in there fifteen years? Uh, Seventeen years. Seventeen. Yeah. Yeah. And right. tell me about the seventeenth year. Well, the seventeenth year was uh, was probably the most exciting year. Um, I was it was my time to shoot a sheep. Finally, I spent all summer hiking in and out of there uh, every every couple of days riding my bike in, finding the sheep, coming back out. So I had it, I had it down to a science. I found some rams and this is going to be my, my, my time to get one finally after 17 yep. years. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, uh, got up pretty early. Uh, I think it started about 11 o'clock at night, drove out, got out there about three in the morning and, uh, hopped on my bicycle and rode in on the trail way back, way into the back. Uh, it was pretty close to, let's say about uh, six, seven o'clock. I was riding up uh, up the trail, kind of up the mountainside. There was two old cowboys sitting there on the edge of the trail drinking coffee. And one guy looked like Lanny McDonald, had a huge mustache. And he's <laughs> looking at me and he's just like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> have this Granola muncher on his bicycle, eh? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, so I rode past them up the hill and they were watching me and they kind of stood on the trail and looked at me as I went by and I just kind of waved and kept on going. I got, uh, to where the trail ends, there's a really steep drainage. So I walked my bike down that and got into more of the kind of willow brushy kind of, ter oh, mostly willow and brush train. Yeah. Crawling through, crawling through that and just taking a step and looking for sheep. It was it's just just about sunrise, so I was looking on the hillsides across the way where the rams usually hang out. Yep. And, you know, taking a couple steps, looking, looking. And uh, while well, the trail keeps winding down, goes to another drainage and gets real steep. And then the, the bushes start to end, and there's just small spruce trees. Um, there's now, uh, was, one of my favorite. Sorry, was the goal to go in alone? The goal, uh, no, originally I had a friend that was going to come with me and uh, he ended up backing out last minute. He got sick and was unable to make it. So I, yeah. I wanted to go because this is something I'm very passionate about. And, <laughs> and you've been planning for so long. Right? Yeah, and I'm not yeah. one to wait for somebody. If somebody's going to be late, I just keep going because I want to, I'm excited and just want to yeah. go. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but was it, a week or two before that, that you broke your foot falling out of a tree stand? No, that was uh, a couple of years before. Okay. Okay. I, I just yeah. remember reading about the, just showing your grit and determination. You fall out of a tree stand, break your foot, ah, whatever, strap it up and just keep hunting. And and so that story <laughs> leading into the hunt, I was like, man, were those back to back? But okay, fair enough. <laughs> you're yeah, that you're was in a couple your years prime. Prior. Okay. You're good to go. So now you're, you're in. Good to go. You're, you're, you're in um watching for sheep yeah so there's a one nice little spot where there's it's kind of like a little pier big rock outcrop and there's a spruce tree on that and all surrounded by green moss and it's one of the places I always like to camp uh, and that's where i usually camp but just a nice little safe spot i'm looking at going well i think i should go a little bit further just to make sure the sheep are not in the back bowl it's the day before the season so i wanted to make sure i got a good look in the area so i'm camping close to where the sheep are and so I cross the drainage, get up on this little hill, and as I come up over the, well, it's not a little hill, it's pretty steep kind of cliff drainage, 
Uh, so I climb up over top of that, got my bike there, and I walk a little bit further. And I noticed some sheep off off in the distance. I'm like, oh, that's pretty sweet. We'll see if, uh, see if there's any rams in there. I got my bike sitting out in front of me there and took my backpack off to a little stretch. Uh, I got on my handlebars, my elbows, and just peered across the valley with my binoculars. I was watching, looking at some sheep. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. There's some ewes and lambs, and there's uh, one young ram. Uh, and so I was watching them for you know a couple of minutes, thinking like, well, this would be a good spot to stop and get something to eat. And as I was looking across, I brought my binoculars down, and this little brown thing ran in front of me, literally within 10 feet. And as soon as I seen it, I knew right away I was screwed. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. And, and uh, my first instinct was to uh, grab my bear spray. Of course, I didn't have it on me. Stupid me. Uh, <laughs> so as I'm reaching down in my backpack to grab my bear spray, I bent down and I heard this crack sound kind of over my right shoulder. And as I turned and looked, there was mama. She had been, oh, maybe four or five feet away. I remember her coming, she was on a full dead run. She had her paw stretched out to grab me. And I could just remember seeing the whites of her eyes and her teeth. Um, and just out of instinct, I grabbed my bicycle and just dropped in front of her and stepped aside. It's like a slow motion here. She's like almost beside me, just step aside. And yeah. Dropped my bike in front of her. Um, of course, I didn't have my bear spray out, my gun, nothing, just my pack. Uh, I grabbed my frame pack and I had the, the part that goes against your back was facing away and I had the outer part of the pack against my chest. So she was caught in the bike. Her One of her paws was through the back tire and the other one was stuck in the, in the frame with her head and she kind of looked at me trying to shake it. Uh, she turned around and shook it off and came at me. Uh, first thing I did was jam my pack in, in her face trying to push her away and smash it over the head with it. Uh, she grabbed my hands and just made a mess of them. You can hear, you know, like the bones crunching and her teeth grinding against my hands and the pack frame. And so I was pushing her, trying to keep her back. Uh, then she just stopped and kind of turned away and started walking away. I'm like, well, okay, well, this is, this is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was felt some kind of sigh of relief. Like, okay, that wasn't so bad. Uh, and I was trying to get my gun off the pack. I was just scrambling, you know, just. I guess kind of panicking. Ah, well, I was panicking. Oh, for sure. <laughs> How could you not? It, it's so, you know, I was just watching her walk away, trying to unclip the gun and try to, or try to pull my bear spray out. And I looked up again. She turned around. She just did a little quick little spin. And then she was coming in hard. Uh, we were probably separated by about 30, 40 feet. Well, I did a real stupid thing. I uh, threw my pack at her and decided, well, I'm fairly good shape. I can probably run up that hill just as fast as she is. She could, or maybe, yeah, maybe quicker, but no. <laughs> <laughs> my my whole object was to run up the hill and then turn and turn downhill and jump into a tree. So at least I don't yeah. have to start from the ground zero. I, yeah. I thought that was a smart idea, but so, uh, it sounds like a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> Except being able to outrun a bear who can outrun horses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is. It's surprising how big and how fast they can move. Like, I mean, they're, yeah. they're on you. Well, yeah. I took up the hill. I got about maybe 60, 70 feet. And I'm like, oh, there's a perfect tree. So I grab it, swing myself around and jump in it. And I got uh, about four feet up the tree. My one leg was hanging low. My right leg was hanging low. And I'm just pushing myself up to jump up that next step. And I just remember seeing her below the tree looking at me going, yummy. and looking down i can see her looking up at me she reached up with her one paw grabbed my right leg and just pulled me down and then she lunged up with her mouth and as i could see her mouth wrapping around my leg i was like this is gonna hurt yeah and then she just grabbed a hold gave her one shook threw me right out of the tree i hit the so ground and how high were you up the tree uh i was probably maybe five feet six feet wow yeah so I didn't I didn't get up that high, but uh, her I guess my chest was about the five foot six foot level, so my legs were oh, okay. down a little bit lower. Yeah, you were nowhere out of her out of the danger zone. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so I thought I climbed a really big tree, but according to the game wardens, I climbed the smallest tree in the hillside. <laughs> to this day, I still 
I still argue with him on that one, but he's like, no, no, you climbed a little tiny tree, but I, I want to think I climbed the bigger one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, when I hit the ground, I was kind of stunned for a second. It's laying. I'm like, okay, well, well, what next, right? Do you play dead? What do you do? Um, my instinct was, well, I'm just going to crawl underneath the spruce tree and wrap myself around it. Uh, got the spruce brows there. Oh, how is she going to be able to pull me away? It'd be harder for her. So I yeah. wrapped myself around the tree and held on. And she's digging out with her paws. And I was like, yeah, this is an awesome idea because she couldn't really get at me. And she was trying to dig at, dig at me and nothing was really happening. And then all of a sudden she stopped and just grabbed me by the side, just right by the left side, kind of uh, right in the love handle area. Yeah. She grabbed me, picked me up like nothing, and then threw me about six feet. Um, that was surprising. I just, I remember hitting the ground again and going, holy crap. And then bang, she was on top of me within half a second. Uh, the first, the first thing she did was uh, bite me right in the face or two front teeth caught me one on the, on the left eye, just on either side of the eye and just yeah. crunched down. I could feel my eye socket and my jaw, everything just crunch. Um, it just, you just feel everything bones breaking and sound like ice. It, it was just a, it's a weird feeling. Like I didn't feel anything at the time, but you could just hear it. Yeah. It was more, more the, the audible, not the, you, you, shock or whatever it is set in and you you didn't have the the instant sharp pains it was more just the the numbness and, and realization of everything that that's occurring yeah it was just more like the sound the smell of her just the the feeling it's, yeah it's a weird feeling it, and it was all in slow motion like it seemed like it'd take her like 20 seconds to bite me in the face when really it probably was like half a second right yeah it's like being in a, I guess, like a NASCAR driver and you lose control and you're flipping in the air and you're going to hit the wall. Everything's in slow motion. Yeah. And then you hit the wall. That's what it, it's kind of the best way I can describe the feeling. Yeah. So this is attack number two. She's pulled you out of the tree. She's flung you six feet in the air or six feet and then pounces on you. And now she's crunched into your face. She's like, are you laying on your back face up? And she's. I was laying kind of on my right side yeah um laying there and trying to cut a, curl up in a ball like they tell you yeah. to, how you to play dead yeah um, yeah it was her her first bite and then she came in and she bit me again and kind of on the forehead and i'm laying there and go man that, now that one hurt i felt i felt pain on that one yeah and i'm laying there going wow this sucks to play dead like this is this is not fun you yeah, know, I'm not going to live through this. I might as well just try something. Yeah. So then I rolled over and I was like, screw this. Like, this hurts. <laughs> so I yeah. rolled, over to my, rolled over to my back and just the bear, she was, was going to come down to bite me again. And I took my right hand, started punching her in the face, poking her eye. I had my finger on the corner of her nose, was peeling it back. And she was trying to snap out my hand. Yeah, and then she comes down with another forceful bite. Like she came in hard to bite me again, and it was like perfect. It was just like ah oh, moment when she was bringing her head down. It was perfect. I punched with my left hand up, and I managed to shove my hand into her mouth and shove my fingers down her throat and grab her tongue. And she, <laughs> <laughs> when when I did that, just the shock on her face. It it was just it changed from like, like, holy crap. Like she was scared for a moment. Yeah. You, you so went from I, prey to not predator, but I mean, you hadn't fought back to this point. So now no. something's pissing her off and, and fighting. Yeah. And so then when I, when I did that, uh, I grabbed a hold of her tongue and everything. And I squeezed as hard as I could fingers down her throat. She was yeah. almost like gagging and choking. Uh, she, trying to close her mouth. And I remember looking at my arm and a good chunk of my forearm was in her mouth. And I was like, wow. Uh, and she couldn't close her mouth. She was having trouble. And I just, I just remember my hand was sliding in. It felt like leather. And you could feel all the scars on her tongue and the bumps near the back of her mouth got a little bit smoother. And then you could feel yeah. down her throat. Uh, it was, it's very distinct feeling. Like to this day, it still haunts me when, uh, yeah thinking about that yeah so when my hand in her mouth uh, she was 
her uh, back of her body was on the was on the right side of me, and her back paws kept hitting me in the side. Her claws were digging in, and that was really hurting. Uh, so I started pushing on her hind end, trying to push her feet off of me, and my hand slipped in, and I felt like a uh, like the belly, uh, like a belly of a bear. The hair kind of disappears, and you can yep. feel skin more. Yeah, more skin. Yeah, and it's more of a smooth skin, not the bristly hair kind of thing. Yeah, and it's you could definitely tell. Yeah, uh, yeah. So when I pushed off my hand, hit the belly, and I'm like, oh, sweet. Um, I slid my hand up the belly, and I felt some really loose skin I thought at the time was balls. So I grabbed my hands, you know, one hand in mouth, and I grabbed and whatever I thought was balls, I grabbed, twisted, and pulled. She made a horrendous sound, squealed like a pig, like just like a – a regular pig would, yeah. Um, hollered and she got really, um, I don't know what's the word to describe it like frazzled and she was panicking, like flopping around. Uh, so, th- so then I let go and then she took off, making squealing like a pig and just darted off through the bush, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not too bad, you know. Uh, I got up and I so I stood up like nothing, and I just dusted myself off. Um, looked for my hat. I couldn't see my hat. Whatever. I walked down to where my pack was, found my pack, and opened up my pack. And I was like, well, this sucks. You know, like, what do I do now? And I pulled out my phone, and uh, oh, I didn't know what I looked like. So I got my phone out, turned on selfie mode, and took a picture of myself. I'm like, huh, all right. Well, <laughs> what do you do now? <laughs> Because I was like, this is the picture that's online, correct? Correct. And I will uh, will be resharing your post today as a a a teaser. But for anyone that it's not for the faint of heart or the squeamish, because it is probably and I hate to say I've hit the depths of the internet and seen some things that I never should have seen. And it's the picture that you've got there is uh, is pretty gruesome. It's not for the faint of heart, for sure. And I don't even know what, what more to say about it, but uh, if you've got a strong stomach, check it out, because it's it's absolutely amazing to see you sitting in front of me right now and how good you look compared to when you were shredded after that bear attack. So, so you took the selfie. Then what? <laughs> so I took the selfie, and I'm like, well, this is either going to, I mean... I, I thought to myself, like, well, it's not too bad. I can probably go and still hunt the sheep or go on a bear hunt. Would you know? <laughs> it's just that's kind of how I thought. I was I was kind of mad. I was pretty mad. I just sitting there in my pack going, "Well, this sucks." Like now I got to go home. I really want to get a sheep. And <laughs> this was my time to shoot a sheep and this stupid bear. <laughs> yeah. So so I'm sitting there. I'm kind of contemplating, like, what can I? Do? What should I do? Just you know, I'm sitting there and. I, I was more disappointed at first. I didn't really, I didn't, I wasn't thinking I was that hurt. I didn't realize maybe shocked yep. still. Yeah. So I leaned up against this old rotten log that was sitting on the edge of the trail there and got my gun out. And I was like, well, I'm going to, you know, load her up and I don't know what to do. So sitting there leaning against the stump, I have my gun against my left shoulder and I have the clip in my right hand and I'm pushing in shells in. That old Tika 300 Magnum Tika T3 light. So I could pull the clip and put my shells in there. As I'm doing that, I think I got three in. And I was just putting the, trying to get the fourth one or the third one in. I just remember everything going numb. Uh, I just remember my hands dropping. And I could feel, and it, well, it sounded like ice breaking in the back of my head. It's it just like a crackling sound. And uh, it was so loud. Felt like somebody just breaking ice in my ears. Yeah. And then my hands just kind of dropped. The next thing I know, I can hear like breathing and I could feel I'm being pulled. So she came, the the bear came back and she grabbed by the back of the head, kind of at the base of the skull, uh, clamped on and she drug me back in. I felt like a long distance and just. I was completely numb. I couldn't move. I just hearing and you just see the bushes. Just she pulled me over everything, all over the junipers, through the willows. And then 
she stopped and I was like sitting up, but leaning against her, her paws, she was directly behind me. Yeah. And I leaned against her legs and I just remembered like, I couldn't do nothing. Uh, the first, what she started to do, she was chewing on the back of my head and then her right claw caught me on the right side of my face from down over my nose and lips. And yeah. she peeled everything right back. She just ripped all the skin, my eye out, just busted my whole entire face, just one swoop. And then she was gnawing on my on the side of my head like a dog on a bone. Like that's what it felt like. She's just Jeez. crunching away. And yeah. And I I just I couldn't do nothing. Um so that went on for probably oh I want to say hours, but it was probably only like 20 seconds. Yeah. Uh, she moved her legs or repositioned herself. I fell backwards and I hit the ground. It was, it was like, uh, I can all of a sudden like feel things again. It, it was a weird feeling. It was just like, I don't know, being charged back up again. So I'm, I'm laying there and I can't see at this point. Uh, everything was cloudy. Um, it was like looking through fog. Yeah. I could just see this dark thing above me. Um, so I reached up with both hands and I could feel the belly and I reached up and, oh, I'm in the belly area again. Grabbed what I thought was balls with both hands. And I yeah. grabbed, dug in, twisted, pulled up. Uh, she bucked like a bronco and then I wrapped my my legs around her neck and just like a UFC fighter just clamped down and held around her neck and whatever I had, I was trying to rip it off. Yeah. Uh, she was making horrendous sounds squealing jumping she was rolling around she was like a bucking bronco yeah and i can feel my back brush going through the brush quite quickly and she you could just tell like the fear of god was in her <laughs> yeah well and and for uh, anyone that doesn't know how big are you i'm uh six foot two uh at the time of the attack i weighed 230 pounds and i was pretty solid Pretty You're a big kid. bear in that fight. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I won't get too much into the bear at the moment, but how big was that bear? Uh, but the, with the game one's figure about the average size of a sow, so about 400 pounds to 350, okay. 400 pounds. Yeah. Not a monster, but yeah. decent size grizzly. Well, and they're, they're twice the strength of us pound for pound anyways, so. Yeah, they toss me around like a rag doll. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so so you're dragging underneath, you're holding on for dear life, fighting her like an MMA fighter. <laughs> and then I just I felt safe. I guess or felt it was okay for me to let go. So I let go and I just remember her I remember the smell and feeling like her just defecating everywhere. Like it just flowing. Uh so then I let go and I'm laying there and I can't see. Um I I'm missing parts. Uh you know, it's filling my head and my right side, and I didn't have an eye. I, I couldn't find my right eye. Yeah. Uh, there was chunks of my face hanging down. Um, I tried to stand up, and I couldn't. I just, I, whatever I did, I couldn't stand up. Everything, nothing was working. I, I knew relatively where I was on the hill, like where the trail was. Yeah. I just, so I started to crawl downhill, and I came across the trail, and I, you know, I've been in there so many times, hiked in there in the middle of the night that I I could probably find my way out being blindfolded. Yeah. Uh, I got to the trail and I crawled down the trail and I came across my pack pretty quick. I was at this point in time, I was panicking. I found my gun right away and I tried to shove a, a shell down the tube, but my hands were so messed up. I couldn't bend to get my fingers in and I couldn't see to put a shell in. Uh, my left eye at this point in time was hanging down, looking straight at the ground when I looked forward. So in order to see straight on, I had to either pick it up or tilt my head way back. Holy. So uh, how, so uh, reading through that, and I, I looked at the picture, and I looked at the picture, and I zoomed in. Um, your left, uh, like how far down was it hanging? Like, so what, it, are we talking like an inch or two or like? Down to my nose? So my okay, whole eye yeah. socket was completely it was crushed destroyed. it was destroyed yeah and my eye was just like hanging down kind of like in a cartoon oh. you see the yeah people pick their eyeball yeah that's what the, that's the what optical it felt like. cords yeah okay yeah and you could still see out of it at that point but just extremely blurry extremely blurry yeah okay 
and my jaw on the left side was hanging down, was kind of drooping or well, parts of my face, everything was hanging down. So I didn't know, yeah. you know, I didn't know what it looked like at that point. And I, like I said, I couldn't see, I found my gun. That was the easy part to find, but I was panicking, looking around for my clip. And then the first thing I came across was some soft, fuzzy stuff, which was my mustache and goatee. On the ground. On the ground. Yeah. And then I found, I believe it was my ear, and then several other chunks of my head. I found these, so I kind of gathered them up and had them in one hand, and I was still feeling around. Mm -hmm. And I found, I managed to find my clip. And so the first thing I did was slam my clip in the gun and swing around. And anything that looked dark, I shot at it. Uh, and so then, you know, I'm sitting there and I didn't know what to do at this point. Uh, it was pretty bad. There was blood gushing out of everywhere. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't really see, I couldn't stand. Um, this your is face where... is hanging off, your jaw's hanging yep. off. You've gotten, your nose is disconnected and you're missing an ear. You've got one eye where it needs to be and one ear where it needs to be. The rest is, is not where it needs to be. Correct. Nope. Yeah, it was all gone. And I, you know, I was sitting there and I opened up my backpack and I found my first aid kit. And I remember, and it was, I bought this real expensive, what was it called? Uh, the Hunter's Edition or something. It was made for <laughs> hunters. I opened it up and I looked inside and just kind of fumbling through. I'm like, this is garbage. Like, there's nothing Nothing's going to help me. <laughs> <laughs> there was no great big band aid, you know? So. Mm -hmm. That, so that was that was tough. So I'm sitting there and I pulled my phone and uh, you know we just had a little one and uh, just thinking like this is this is it. Like there's no way I'm going to survive this. There's no way I can make it out. And uh, you know I was trying to determine should I just finish myself off there and or just let things happen and just lay down and you know let nature I, take its course. Yeah, and it was that was tough. Um, you know, so I you know, text my wife. I knew she wasn't going to get it, but I knew eventually they, somebody would find me and see the phone. And, um, I took a bunch of pictures in hopes that whoever found me would know that what I went through instead of, you know, some granola munch you getting scratched by a bear. And yeah. so, so I was sitting there and kind of deciding what to do. Uh, that was tough. Um, that was a tough moment. When I finally figured it out, I uh, took my took the pieces of my face and uh, well, I put one of my sweatshirts on upside down, one of my Badlands Badlands shirts. <laughs> and uh, I remember putting it on upside down and opening it up and just taking each piece of my face and laying it down, kind of, I guess, the blood part, the blood part just kind of slowly putting it up and then wrapped it around, tied it around my, uh, underneath my jaw to hold my jaw up in place. Cause it was driving me nuts hanging there and tied it around the back of my neck and tied it really tight. So at least I can hold my head up and things weren't dangling in my way. Yeah. Um, you know, at that point I was so hungry cause I hadn't eaten anything and I, I don't know. I was just, I was hungry. So I grabbed yeah. this pack of Swedish berries <laughs> and, I was trying to open up, of course, when your fingers are all messed up, you can't really, you can't really do anything. So when I open up this, it's like a one kg bag of Swedish berries. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, when I finally got it open, it like exploded and went all over the mountainside. Uh, I remember reading the Game Awards reports. They're like, do you like Swedish berries? Because they were everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> You're just trying to bring more bears in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And so I, I had a bunch of them and I couldn't open my jaw or, or like chew. So I stuck them in on the side of my face because there was nothing there. Like just my teeth kind of hanging out. I yeah. stuck them in my mouth and just let them dissolve in my mouth. And yeah, I uh, grabbed my water bottle and threw another shirt over top of myself. Uh, at the time, I was wearing shorts and a T-shirt. And when you're in the mountains early season, it gets pretty hot and sunburn and all that stuff would kind of wear you out. So I threw uh, sweaters over top of my shoulders trying to protect me from the sun because I was quite out. I was exposed. And this was yeah. uh, 9.36 a.m. is when uh, 
when I took the selfie. So, uh, so the, so after I decided what I was going to do, I tried to stand up and the first 10 feet, I probably fell a hundred times. I just couldn't get on my feet. Uh, all the tenants, well, I found it later on that all the tenants, my right leg were severed at the knee. So I really had no, I had no strength in it and couldn't, it was just basically a dead leg. Yeah. Um, I also at the time, I, I don't know why, but I had about 40 rounds of ammo with me. <laughs> to this day, I don't know why. I never, I never shoot that many bullets in like 10 seasons. So you're a su sucker for punishment. And you wanted that extra weight in your pack just to go in heavy. <laughs> yep. I, I think, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say that that was from the couple of years previous to I put shells in there and kept forgetting about them. Yeah. That's my yeah. story. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> We've got a solution for you that we'll get into that. It's something that we build that you need. Uh, no one else is doing it. We're off topic, but it's on this exact topic. And I, I had it built. Robbie Austin talks about after his grizzly attack, he he came in and had Greg build him one. So we do a second, we, we do a aftermarket stock for Tikas with a second mag well up inside the butt stock. So I've got a three round or a five round mag out the bottom of my butt stock. I can just push a little tab release just like you would for your mag release. So I've got two mags fully loaded in my gun at all times. So if I have nice. an issue with the first one, I've got a second I can slam in. Not a sales plug at all, but something that you definitely <laughs> will need for your next trip. <laughs> so, so uh, on my on the first you know hundred feet or so, anything dark got three rounds. It didn't matter what it was. I can just if I can see it look dark, you got three rounds. Yep. Uh, and then the very first. Part of the trail that goes down into really steep drainage is probably a three, four hundred foot drop down to the bottom of the drainage. There's a creek there, kind of cliffs all the way down the one side, it's kind of comes to a point, a triangle, but very steep hill. So the first, you know, I started going down there. The first little bit was fine, but then I fell and I tumbled down to the bottom, uh, head over heels, ended up into some big boulders, laying there. And I was pretty mangled, couldn't really move, uh, you know, smashed my head a bunch. Uh, my arms were stuck underneath the rocks. I was laying on my side. I just, I couldn't move. Everything hurt so bad. Um, it just was a struggle just to try to untangle my legs from each other. And I yeah. just, I couldn't do it. And I laid there and I, and I like, well, this is, this is it. Like, you know, at least I'm out in the open. Um, I like to get further back on the trail so it's easier for somebody to find me. But this was, this was it. I pulled out my phone and I'm, you know, fingers all messed up and I'm trying to enter in my passcode and I uh, was fumbling around with it. And I'm trying to play music just to, you know, music helps me, helps me sleep. So this is just yeah. perfect. Just play some music and let things happen. Well, I got my phone out and I was hitting, trying to get on the music. Uh, Baby Shark came on, and uh, that's a song we we played for my daughter when she couldn't sleep or put her to bed. It soothed her. So that that song came on, and I'm laying there listening to it. Um, that kind of gave me a little bit extra willpower to get up. And on top of that, it was on repeat. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm laying there in the rocks and there's baby sharks playing. I got up. Uh, I didn't stand, but I, I managed to crawl up the other side of the drainage. Well, probably about a half a half a kilometer or so off the side. And then I don't, I only remember bits and pieces, but I remember crawling across that mountainside all the way to almost the main trail. Uh, it was a little steep for me to, to walk because every time I go to stand up, I'd fall over. So I just crawled. And from what the game wardens who did the investigation said, I pretty much crawled in a straight line across the mountainside. I crawled through deadfall, whatever. I just went in a straight line. Uh, and I, I want to rewind to the baby shark. Cause I, with a two-year-old and a four-year-old, I'm, I'm well aware of the song. It's played thousands of time and times in my house. <laughs> and I'm guessing it's not to do with the annoyance of the song, but what it stood for. 
Yeah, it definitely is more of what it stood for. I mean, the song does get to you after a while, but <laughs> but that's not what motivated you, right? <laughs> no, it wasn't. That, it was that, just that whole... reminded you of the baby at home waiting for you. Yeah, and at this point in time, it didn't matter if she was crying or screaming. I'd I'd been happy to be there. You would have rather been there than on the mountain for sure. And and she definitely. was just she was young at the time. How how old was she when this all went down? Uh, about six months, I think. About six months old. Yeah. So it was yeah, our, and, our first and, one, and the, actually the first time I was away from home with the wife and the little one. So uh, it was a kind of a a big step, a big jump. Yeah, yeah. Laying there in the laying there in the rocks or in the bottom, you're just thinking about you know you're gonna miss her graduation, weddings. That stuff kind of rolls through your head and gets to you pretty quick. Yeah, no kidding. It. Uh... That sort of thing, I, like uh, at 40 years old now, I always thought I was 10 feet tall and made of steel until I had kids. Then then <laughs> it brought my mortality in, in, into place. And now every time I get on a motorcycle, every time I head into the mountains for a, a, a three-day hike hunt, five-day whatever, that that thought always goes through my head. I got to come home to my kids. That's that's the motivation. And so that's why I had to stop and rewind this back to the baby shark, because it's not about the song, but it's about what that stood for. And that, uh, arguably is probably the big thing that really pushed you to move forward that and your, your loving wife at home. Definitely. Both of them were the huge part. Just trying to think of my wife, trying to look after her little one by herself and just, yeah. or, or the whole ordeal would actually bug me. The most was, her having to wait for them to find me so she know what happened. It's that time before you recorded missing and then they find you and knowing what happened. Like, yeah, that yeah. unsettling time. I didn't never wanted her to, to live with that. So my goal was always just to make it further down the trail. So it's easier for somebody to find me. Cause you didn't really um, expect to make it out alive. Right. Well, I would, I didn't, I, my whole thought through my head was I'm not going to make it, but let's just make it to, just just make it to the next trail. Let's make yeah. it to the next drainage where more people go. I mean, yeah, there's only maybe one or two other people I'll do that would hike back in there, but just to make it to the next point where the trail's more traveled, I guess. Um, yeah. And then you'd make it to along. that point. And then you'd make it to that point but and still had more energy. Uh, yeah, that was the surprising part. When I got off of the mountainside and onto the main trail, I was like, okay, well, I don't have far to go until where I ran into the guys in the morning where their camp was. The two cowboys. Maybe the two cowboys. So I'm just like, okay, well, I'm going to head down to there. And and I'm stumbling through. I'm not moving very fast. I'm falling down, trying to keep up. And then I get down to where the cowboys were. I'm walking down that trail, and I can't really talk. I can only make funny noises and moan. Uh, yeah. My jaw was still hanging there, and I couldn't see at all. It was just, I could see, but not, it was all fuzzy. Everything was way out of focus. And okay. You could just see dark and then what was light. And so I stuck with the light area, and I knew the trail well because I can hike it. I was hiking in there in the middle of the night with no flashlights back and forth. So I, I knew relatively where it was. When I got to the part where the cowboys were, I'm walking down and i making noises and hollering and looking that they weren't there and i knew exactly where their campsite was they're usually there every year yeah they weren't there i'm looking and looking they're not there i can't see anybody i can't hear any horses um so that was very depressing when i got to there because i thought okay well there's somebody can get me out of here yeah but uh, nobody there so then my next thought was okay well at least i'm at the main trail but there's another mile or so to go before the trail splits. And then if I get to the, where the trail splits, every sheep hunter goes past that spot. So yep. there's a, there's a good spot to make it to. So hiking, walking down that trail, there's a, a Creek, uh, drops about five, six feet. And there's a little Creek you have to cross. It's, it's kind of a nice little spot to sit and I usually fill up my water bottles there. And, but I get to that. And I'm looking down, and it's pretty sharp drop. I fell down it face first into the creek, and I'm laying there in the creek, and I, you know, just kind of like drown and trying to drag myself out. So I drag myself out of that, and I climb up the other side, and the other side is not too bad. It's 
maybe about a three foot uh, elevation over 10 feet. Uh, but I struggled to get up it. And I got up and I hung on to this rock up there and just to hold myself to catch my breath. And um, that was another one of those moments where I thought, you know, I was getting really dizzy, lightheaded that I probably was going to pass out. Yeah. But I got up and kept moving. And about another three kilometers, four kilometers from there was the uh, an outfitter that used to come in there. They set up their camp in early August and they're there till I don't know, end of October. And they're always there. But this morning when I rode past them, no one was outside the tent. So I figured they're all still sleeping. But I figured, well, that's my best chance. There's always somebody in that camp all the time. Yep. So yep. I'm going to make it to there. Uh, when it got further down the trail, it gets to the creek and it's all washed out and braided. And the trail, well, this is the year after the flood. I think it was the year after the flood that we had in uh, Alberta there where it totally flooded out Calgary. Anyways, yep. that whole area got washed out in the flats and the original trail was washed out. I wasn't quite sure where to go. So I decided to stick down the creek and just follow the creek down. I knew where the outfitters camp was. I'd be able to recognize it. I ended up walking down the creek, and at this point in time, my leg, my right leg was uh, pretty stiff, and I was like dragging it, so I was just dragging across the rocks, and I remember getting up to deadfall would be in front of me and just trying to figure out, should I climb over it or go around it, because I was just so tired, and and you know, most of the time, I would crawl over it, try to get over it. Yeah, uh, and so and then, in in this... Um, you heading down the trail in my head, it looks like one thing, but I, I, I don't think I'm thinking about it correctly. Are you on all fours crawling out this whole way? Are you kind of hobbling out on one leg, dragging the other? What, what's going on physically at this point? A little mixture of both. Uh, well, nothing on the crawling on my knees was more like an army crawl or yeah. standing up and dragging my right leg, kind of okay. one step and dragging my leg over and did you have anything uh, as a crutch or anything like that? Or it was just I, zombie walking my, the whole way? Kind of a zombie walk, more or less. I had my yeah. gun with me that was helping me hold up in, in spots. Yeah. Uh, most of it was just like a zombie walk. Wow. And and, and I, we're not we're not talking 500 meters here. If I remember correctly, your attack was, what, 16 or 17 kilometers from where you had parked? Correct. In yeah. The, uh, and this outfitter's camp was uh, about five kilometers from where I parked. So this was, wow. I'd say, about yeah. half to three quarters of the way back. Yeah. Unbelievable. It, it, it's hard to think that you could army crawl and, and zombie walk 11K to this point after what you had been through. I mean, you had to have been leaking pretty bra badly. Like, the blood loss just had to have been horrific. I, I remember in the book it talks about the way you had pulled your face up and wrap that shirt around and contain some of the blood with toilet paper and stuff. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm jumping ahead here. What did you do with, with, with your, your core and your leg? Like just, did you do anything to try and stop the bleeding shortly after the attack or? No, I didn't realize those were that bad. Uh, okay. I knew my leg, it was all covered in blood all the way down the right side. I actually yeah. didn't really know about the puncture wounds on my side. I uh, realized how bad they were until later on. Okay. And at this point, at this point in time, it was still just my shirt uh, holding my head together and tied underneath my jaw. When I uh, when I walked down the creek, I got to the outfitters, the outfitters tent, and they have a electric fence around the place. So I remember walking around the fence and finding the gate. So I got in, uh, opened up the gate, and I got into the first tent, and there was nobody there. Um, so that was. That part sucked. That was that oh, was hard. Shattering. <laughs> it's your it's your hope. This is your hope that you can finally uh, uh, release everything you've got going on to somebody else to now take care of you. And now there's nobody there to help. Nobody I, can, there. I, I couldn't imagine the heartbreak. And that was hard. And then I went to the next tent, opened it up, nobody there. And then I looked, I could looking for horses or you know trying to mumble around. And I knew they kept their horses. No horses there. And I was like, wow, this is, this is devastating. Yeah. Um, so then I, I got into the first tent, which is where they keep all their kitchen supplies and medical items, radios usually. 
they had a big wooden cabinet and they had a fancy little lock on there. And I was trying to get it. And my hands are so messed up. I couldn't, I couldn't open it. So I just grabbed the cabinet, knocked it over and all these cans of soup and food came out rolling out. And there was a, a black case. It looked like a, like a, a phone case, like old mic phone with the radio. Yep. I was so happy. So I got that and I'm beating that against the cabinet, trying to open it up and it opened it up and it was a, a Leatherman. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I was so disappointed. I'm like, oh. oh no! And I'm trashing through their bins, just knocking everything over. It can't open up the bin, so I'm trying to knock it over, fall on the ground, and um, no radios in there. I found uh, toilet paper and or some, I think it was toilet paper, or almost like bounty sheets, and that was spilled out. And uh, there was this like a triangle shaped can, and I remember. As a kid, these tri- my grandma used to have these triangle shaped cans, and they were full of spam, like the yep. the ham. And I, yeah. you know, at this point in time, I was so hungry, and I just I wanted to eat that. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know why. It just I wanted to eat it. So I grabbed this can. You know, I got the little rolly thing on there. Well, I mean, that's impossible when you can't see or can't use your hands. Yeah, your so, your hands are completely chewed up. Your face is torn up. How are you going to get into this can? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just so. Anyways, I'm beating that against the table, against the the cabinet, using another can. Finally, I get it open enough, and I peel it open. I'm like, okay, awesome. So I'm gonna go sit at the table now and eat. And and now all throughout this whole entire time, Baby Shark has been playing on repeat. <laughs> <laughs> so don't forget about that. <laughs> so I'm I'm sitting at this table. And I'm trying to eat, and I'm trying to put, get a chunk of ham and shove it inside my face. And as I'm doing this, blood is just dripping all over the table. And I got this rig. I'm trying to wipe the blood off because it's, I don't know, it's like water dropping on what you're trying to work on. You know, it just drives you nuts. So there's just yeah. blood dripping everywhere. And I'm trying to wipe it up. And I just, like, it was frustrating. But I found toilet paper and I wrap my hands up and I go okay well that will solve that problem and so I'm trying to eat and I'm looking down and the blood's still pouring down from my head and then I was like okay so I'm gonna wrap that up so I started wrapping that up and then it would just get soaked and it would fall down <laughs> so then I found some tape I thought it was like medical tape but it was they call it vet wrap I guess and it's what they use for horses to tape up their ankles yeah yeah and so I found a roll of that, and so I just wrapped myself with more paper towel and toilet paper, and then I took the vet wrap, and I just kind of wrapped myself, my head around, and when I was doing that, I was trying to move my jaw over, because the way I was sitting, it was kind of hurting and uncomfortable, so when I was moving it, it clicked into place, and it was like a total relief, like, I could move it again. Wow. Uh, and I was, like, I was like, ooh, test, test, you know, I'm like, well, yeah. I could talk again. Yeah. <laughs> So then I got it set up and folded up some of the pieces of my face and just wrapped her up in the tape. And, and then I continued eating my ham. And uh, during this process, I was very tired and exhausted. And I kept almost like falling asleep. Uh, so I got on my phone and I could kind of see what I was doing. I set a timer on repeat for, I don't know, if it was like 20 seconds or 30 seconds it was set for. But just it would beep and I'd have to go and stop it because uh, I didn't want to fall asleep. Right. And then I'm sitting there and trying to eat and didn't really know what to do. I found uh, I found some juice boxes and I was like, oh, these are cool. <laughs> I got this big, this big bin full of juice boxes. I just started squirting those into my mouth and, uh, you know, great. I remember it was great flavor. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> so this what what time are we talking now because the mauling occurred you said about 9 9 9 30 and what time is it now it's you've hiked out 10 11 kilometers back to this camp now what kind of time are we talking i'm guessing this is probably around 1 2 o'clock ish yeah okay and so when i was sitting in there and the alarm set the alarm uh you know i got really i was really tired and exhausted i uh ate what I could, and then I grabbed a sleeping bag, and I laid it out on the floor, grabbed a pillow, and I opened up their stove, and they always had it set up for a fire at any given time, matches right there. Yep. I was going to light a fire and just 
lay down. I was, at this point, I was really cold, uh, drained, extremely exhausted. So I laid everything out. And, of course, we got Baby Shark playing. And, and I sat there for a minute and then just decided, you know what? Let's, it's not that much further. Let's make it a little bit further down the road. Maybe the outfitters are coming into camp. Maybe they had to go pick up a hunter and they're coming in for the afternoon. So I, this is my thought. I, so I got to the table and I found a piece of paper and a, a Sharpie. And I felt bad because the place, there was blood everywhere, all over the tent. <laughs> <laughs> I totally trashed the inside of the tent, food everywhere. And so I wrote him a little, I wrote him a note, you know, like, hey, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I got mauled by a bear, so suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, I guess the note turns pretty dark on the backside where I told him I should call my wife and let her know I tried. Because I still, at this point, didn't think I was going to make it. Like, I, there was no chance of me making it. You know, I lost tons of blood. Just, just remembering looking at, remembering like looking down at the table and the chair I was in, the, just covered in blood and yeah. over the floor. I mean, that was hard. No kidding. So I, I got up and I went out the front of their front of the tent. I still had my gun and I looked in my pocket and I had. I think I had three more bullets left. And I was like, oh, hell, let's just fire off a couple bullets. Maybe maybe somebody would hear and come. Fired off my last three bullets, put my gun inside the tent, and uh, there was still five juice boxes left in the little pack. And I was like, perfect. I'll grab those. And I know it's about five, you know, five or so kilometers on the way out. I'll just drink one every kilometer and, you know, go from there. Uh, <laughs> see how far really, you make it. See how far you make it. Yeah, it, this part of the trail from here on out, it was basically a road. A little walking down, and they had uh, they used to have you know there's a few signs, kind of like mile markers. There's you know sign to turn or old bridge. They're about all about a kilometer apart. And I just remember just drinking the juice box, save it for a certain section, and I drop it in the trail and keep going and open up the next one and. About every kilometer I dropped on, right in the middle of the trail. And also on this trip, I started dropping clothing off. Uh, like the sweatshirts I had over top of my shoulders and my jackets. I just started dropping them off because it was getting closer and closer to my vehicle. I didn't need as much stuff. Yeah. And so I, you know, dropped my water bottle. I had I was carrying a water bottle the whole time. Um, I don't know why, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> so just dropping all those things off. And at the very, near the end of the trail, you cross the creek again. I mean, you make a total of 11 creek crossings, I think it was, that I ordealed. So the yep. last one, you're going to cross the creek, and you can go up up the ridge, up and over. Or you could follow the creek down and then climb about 200 yards to the truck. I've never walked down the creek and hiked up to the truck, but I have an idea where to go. Yep. Um, I was just sitting there just trying to decide and I figured, well, I know everybody walks down the trail. So let me, I'll just walk up the big hill. Um, I started to walk up the hill and, and it's, it's not a nice hill. Well, it wasn't a nice hill at the time. (laughs) (laughs) And it's fairly steep near the end. Uh, and there's two boulders on the trail that are right in the middle of the trail. Every time I ride my bike down, I almost fall. I hit them. I've always been too lazy just to move them off of the trail. They're just, I don't know, they're just like a, a marker for me. And I remember walking up the hill, and I get to the two boulders sitting there. And they're not very big, maybe a little bit bigger than a soccer ball. Yeah. And I remember seeing them, and I was so excited going, hey, that's the top of the hill. Like, I'm almost at my truck. And to my surprise, I still had a juice box left. So I grabbed the last juice box. I was so excited. I, it just the rocks are here, the hills here. I've almost made it. I got another kilometer left till the truck, and it's all downhill. Like this is exciting. So the last juice box is just sucked it right back, squirt it in my mouth, dropped it on the rock, give you know, kissed my hands and just touched the rock and like thank you. And I I made it to my truck. 
uh, where the my truck was parked, there's a, a gate that goes across the road. And I got to that, and this is where I probably made the dumbest decision, even worse than fighting the bear. <laughs> <laughs> this gate, you know, standing looking at it, I can go 30 feet to the right side and walk in some water and get around the gate to my truck, or I can walk 80 feet on the other side around the gate and then get to my truck. But no, I decided to crawl underneath the gate. <laughs> it's... And so I bent down to go underneath the gate. And as I was going underneath, I got real lightheaded real quick. Um, I started to kind of pass out. And there was a, a road sign there. And they have like the holes in the sign. The post yeah, is the hole. In the in post. It. Yeah. Yeah. So I jammed my fingers into there and tried to grab one to the sign. Because I knew if I fell over, I, I'd be like, I'd have been done. And yeah. I'm trying to hold on, trying to keep myself up. And I finally, I don't know, probably do 10 minutes is kind of kneeling there holding on i actually had enough strength to get up and not and i didn't pass out so then i'm like well that was real stupid because that would have been that would have been it if i would have fell over i don't think i would be able to get up uh, you make it all the way back to the truck and then make the decision <laughs> to crawl under the fence and that's the end that's the end yeah, the yeah. Dumbest thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get to my truck and i know i know i'm messed up i know i i don't look very pretty uh, so the first thing I did was really I pushed my mirror out of the way of my truck. And I, I was driving a Ford at the time and had the little pin code on the side. And, yep. you know, I'm one of those guys that locks their keys in their truck. So this is perfect for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't remember to grab my keys when I was uh, in my pack from when I got mauled. So I always had a spare set in the truck. Mm -hmm. So I uh, typed in the code, opened up the door, and I tried to climb in. Well, I got into the seat. And, I, and then I just grabbed the rear view mirror and pushed that away so I couldn't see anything. Grabbed my keys and I started up the truck. And I'm like, okay, awesome. I looked forward and I couldn't see the end of the hood. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, this is great. I rolled down the window and I stuck my head on and I looked down to the ground and I, I couldn't see the ground. I couldn't tell where the ground was. And I had my eye kind of held up so I could look somewhat forward but i still yeah. had my head kind of tilted back at about a i don't know probably a 20 to 30 degree angle so i could see forward yeah and so i, I knew the road quite well uh, when i was looking out the front window i could just see like green and dark green and then a light patch and i go well the light patch has to be the road oh, aim for the middle of that light patch aim for the middle yeah <laughs> i remember driving down the road I felt like I was hitting the rocks, the trees, the ditch. Everything was so bumpy. Uh, there was spots on this road where it just drops off to the cliff. There's no guardrails, barriers. It's like a, a little bit better than a two-rut well road. It, uh, it's got some hairpin turns, lots of, yeah. I don't know, uh, the old road going to Golden back in the early 2000s or in the okay. 90s. Yeah. That's what it was like driving on but gravel. Gotcha. Uh, so driving all down that, got around the hairpin turn, and then getting closer to uh, civilization, I guess. There's a bunch of lodges all the way down the beginning part of that road. Like there's Mountaineer Lodge and Sunset Resort, Panther River. They happen to be the one that's farthest, the closest to me. And the week... It was a couple days before we actually stopped in there and ate lunch at Panther River. So I kind of knew the place where to go. I drove down the road and I found I found their driveway in, which I don't know to this day how I did because it's kind of kind of a tricky way to get in. Yep. I drove in and I tried to park beside another vehicle and I couldn't I didn't want to hit them, so and I felt bad. So I just ended up driving right up to the lodge where, you know, you're not supposed to drive. So I parked <laughs> my truck <laughs> right at the base of the, at the, at the ramp and I hiked up this ramp and it's a little kind of like a round uh, viewing room where the diner and on this deck and they got a very low roof with all these, with the logs sticking out every four or five feet. And, you, and if you're, you know, I'm tall enough that I can smack my head on them. So I'm walking along and there's this glass 
all the way around. It's like a big hexagon, I guess. And I'm walking like a zombie, dragging my legs, and I got my head tilted so I don't hit the sides. Uh, I see like a shadow or a... somebody was sitting there at the table, and they jumped up quickly. You know, I could just see the motion. Yeah. They come around, coming around to the front door, and I open up the door, and I'm hobbling in, and I'm like, hey, I need some help. <laughs> and the ladies, there's uh, two ladies there. Well, not not right away. When I walked in, I could just hear this little kid, uh, uh, mommy or grandma, somebody's playing a prank. And I'm like, no, I just got mauled by a bear because, you know, walking in like a zombie and covered in yeah. blood. Uh, so the two ladies come out and they're like, oh, my God, what what can I do? And I, I'm like, here's my wallet. Here's my name. Here's my phone. Call my wife. And I need yeah. a glass of water, medium temperature, no ice. <laughs> so, and, and, and the first one that saw you was what an eight-year-old boy yeah eight-year-old boy yeah he was who, who, who ran to get whole thing. His, his sister's help or something who was the manager uh, at the time ran ran to go get his grandma who uh was working there and then he went yep. and ran and got his mom who was actually taking and getting prepared for a wedding that was supposed to happen Right. Uh, right around the time that I arrived. You showed up. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> they got me this glass of water, and I was trying to call my wife, I guess, trying to FaceTime her, and it yeah. wasn't working. Um, I don't know, maybe because it didn't have a face. I don't know, but it wasn't working. <laughs> then uh, uh, I gave them all my ID. They're on the phone, and I'm on one, and I'm drinking my water, and um, I was dripping blood over the place and I was on the floor with a paper towel trying to clean up the blood. <laughs> and the one lady's like, you don't have to do that. Like, just, just relax. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, right. And that was the, uh, the first person to see me, the nine-year-old boy. So you got his mom. She come in there. Um, her name was Amanda and the other lady working there, Carmen, they, Said, let's get you out of there because they had a wedding party that was coming in. Um, so then uh, they got me to my truck and drove me around to the backside of my uh, backside of their place to kind of keep me away from all the guests and then in the wedding party. Yeah. Um, so then they moved me off to the side. Uh, they were running back and forth on the phone to nine one one stars. And I just remember everybody just running back and forth and panicking. And I, and I kept telling them, like, hey, guys, just calm down. I made it this far. Not that big of a deal. I'm just missing my face. Just, you know, <laughs> like, I want to make it out of here. I made it this far. Yeah. Just keep trying to keep everybody calm because uh, it was – at this point, I knew I was going to make it. Now at this point, I was relaxed. I knew I was going to make it. I made it this far. Uh I was really more worried about having to do first aid on somebody trying to help me <laughs> yeah. than I was about the bear. So mm -hmm. everybody running back and forth. Uh, there was an 18 year old girl that they sat with me next to the truck or sat with me in the truck and just talking to her and she would never look, look at me. And uh, you know, we're just, trying to have a conversation and he doesn't know what to say. You know, I don't have a face and it's really hard to talk. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough to come up with topics that outside of, so how's your day? <laughs> yeah. Like, you, you, do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a dog? What do you do for fun? <laughs> do you plan on having your face back? What's, what are your yeah. thoughts on this? Like, it, oh, I, I, I couldn't imagine how, how she felt. I mean, her account in the book is, is pretty crazy too. And, um, and, and, and just what she must've been going through trying to keep you awake. Cause I guess that's kind of the main thing now is don't let you fall asleep now that you are at a point of relaxation, right? Correct. And, and then at the, also at the time I know I had an, just a juice boxes yep. to drink. Well, in the floor of my truck, I had two Gatorades. And I was like, can you open this? So they opened up the Gatorade and I grabbed, a, a, they had got me a straw and I just sucked back the whole Gatorade right away. Yeah. And what the lady said that uh, after I drank the Gatorade, I started to bleed 
a lot again. Like I started to really bleed and they could tell that I was relaxed. Like I felt safe because I just, I wasn't really bleeding when I got there. And then all of a sudden I just started to really bleed again. Okay. They were pretty, pretty worried. And the owner of the lodge, she's same age as me. She ended up calling her dad who had a helicopter and said like, you need to come here and get, get him out guy. of here. Like, yeah. Well, well, because well, they had called for an ambulance numerous times and they couldn't figure out where you were, right? Like 911 just, they're like, uh, well, and, and they, they couldn't put A to B to figure out where to come pick you up. So they're like, and they, STARS was, because they, they initial, initially called STARS, but STARS was delayed or, or couldn't land there or something. There was something was, going on that they couldn't show up. Yeah, they were busy and then something about high winds and one in Edmonton was was on a job in Calgary. They couldn't fly or yeah, I, I'm not sure the whole story on that. I kind of stayed away from that. Yeah. Yeah. And so she called her dad, who's a pilot and who was elsewhere, but dropped everything to, to come and get you. Correct. And he, he landed right there. Uh, they got me out of the vehicle and they, I just remember they're getting me into the helicopter. They put a tarp all across the helicopter. I thought it was kind of funny. I mean, it's, it's a pretty nice helicopter. They got this big blue tarp inside, and they're like, sit here. So, uh, <laughs> Quit leaking everywhere. You're going to make a mess. Yeah. So I'm sitting in the helicopter, and uh, Amanda's beside me. She's the owner. That was her dad. And she just, she was devastated and trying to stay calm. And I'm in the helicopter. I'm looking out the window, um, and then I get this sharp poke, and I turn and look at her, and I'm, she was trying to, she thought I was falling asleep. So I was looking out the window. I mean, I couldn't see anything, but I'm trying to see. Yeah. I yeah. Just You're in a helicopter. Poke. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I turn and look at her and then she pulled the tarp up and I'm like, well, what the, what's your problem? So I look out the window again and I get another shirt poke. I'm like, what? And then hold the tarp up. Well, I guess I was coughing and blood was out everywhere. And so she thought I was falling asleep. So she's trying to wake me up. And then when she turned, she, I was bleed gushing blood everywhere. So she was trying to protect Stop you from herself. spraying it on her. Yeah. Yes. So I was like, I was just so agitated. Like, what do you do? What do you want? You know, like, you can't. I got, uh, and then, no, I didn't have any earmuffs on. So I couldn't hear her anyways. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's just funny. Every time I look over, there's this blue thing in my face. I'm like, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we get to Sundry. Uh, and, uh, we, they land, the the helicopter in Sundry and then there was just like, it was mad chaos. Well, not really. At first it was, it looked, seemed pretty calm. And I remember that my side of the helicopter door opening up and someone go, Oh shit. Like it just, and then chaos struck. Yeah. So they're trying to get me out of the helicopter and, uh, I'm in a lot of pain. My leg is now stiffened up and I can't bend it to get it out of the helicopter and people are pulling on me. And Amanda's yelling at him. She's like, hey, guys, stop. Like, he got in. He can get out. Leave him be. He can get out. Uh, and then I guess one of the doctors or nurses tried cutting around the back of the helicopter, but they have an open blade in the back. Tail rotor. Yeah. Yeah. Tail rotor. So she's tackling them, trying to keep them away from the open rotor. And so, and then I'm trying to get out of the helicopter and I'm turning to get out. And then all of a sudden, I just felt these arms come up behind me and like bear hug me and then just drag me out of the other side of the helicopter. Well, wow. I mean, that was I was pretty quick, and then they throw me in a gurney and take me in the front door, and uh, I was sitting in there, and there was a an older guy that was uh, sitting in the in the emergency room. Now, this is a small town emergency room, so the emergency beds are like literally where you come in and wait. So <laughs> I'm I'm sitting there, and there's only like a they have like a like a screen hanging there. So I'm sitting there and this older guy's there. I guess he had some, was having heart problems, but he's like, yeah, you can go first. You know, like, uh, this is, I don't have chest pains anymore. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm in, so I'm, I'm laying in there and they're stripping me down literally naked. Uh, they're checking on my side, my knee. Um, they were poking at my head and I was fighting with them saying, look at, don't take that off unless you're going to do something right away. Like, don't touch it. Uh, the one doctor was bending my knee and it, the pain was just severe. And I was yelling, you know, Amanda's in there. She's like, just leave him be like, you know, like, what are you going to do? And uh, they were trying to figure out what to do with me. And this 
the same nurse that took me out of the helicopter, her husband got bit by a bear several years ago and he had massive infections from the bacteria in that they got. So, oh uh, yeah, because they're such so filthy animals. Could, correct. Yeah. And so, so she decided first thing to do is to drill into my collarbone and put a, I don't know what's a, some kind of stud in there. And then she injected, um, some antibiotics in me. Yeah. And that was just, just from what her husband went through. She, she did that. Uh, and then they loaded me up in an ambulance and then sent me down to Calgary. Uh, Which is was, what, an hour away? Uh, hour and a half. Uh, that, that was kind of frustrating. So now this this will be right around 4.30ish, 4.45ish. That, okay. Maybe a little bit later. Uh, so they threw me in an ambulance. And uh, laying down the gurney, every time my head would be touched the pillow, it would it'd be excruciating pain. So I wasn't able to lay down. So they had one of the young doctors in there actually hold my head together and kind of cradle it when I laid down. And my whole face was rearranged. And yeah, and that I remember his name was Jamie. He was the the uh, the ambulance uh, EMT. He's in there and he's like telling me like, don't talk, just lay there, you know, let me know if you need air or suction because the blood was dripping down my face. Um, well, they were pretty concerned breathing. about you drowning in your own blood, weren't they? That was one of the big concerns at this point now. One of the yeah, biggest concern was that or me going into cardiac arrest. Uh, so the air was flowing through the upper part of my nose, kind of into my eyes in the top part of my nose, that's where the air was coming out. So we couldn't figure out where to intubate me from if they had to. They were kind of puzzled at that, right? Like, where do, they, where do you put the mask? And and then we came up with uh, hand signs because Jamie, he wouldn't let me talk at all. He just, no, you just, you know, like, uh, you know, two fingers or or the thumb through your two fingers is uh, suck your, like, I'll do suction on your nose or yeah. your mouth is make like bark like a dog so we had these hand signals of what to, of what needed to be done yep and so the whole way the whole way down you know hear the hear the sirens and they're just flying down it seemed like it was only like a 10 minute ride but uh well must have been a lot longer than that <laughs> yeah just before we got to the hospital i got really nauseous and was like ready to throw up um so they gave me something to try to stable me and and then they brought me in in the emergency room in the Foothills Hospital in Calgary. At, at the time, the Foothills Hospital was doing renovations on their emergency room part. So I had to come through where normal patients come through. Yeah. So the will be in a gurney past uh, my wife, my mom, my sister. My sisters, they're all sitting there waiting at the hospital, and they pushed me through them uh into the back and that was uh that was pretty hard for well my whole family seeing me missing that, that was one of the tough parts for me to read as well and i've got a note written down here specifically on that is when your mother saw you i think through the ambulance window when you first pulled up and she was there and it, it, it to be in what says a woman looked through the window and, and pulled back in a gasp or something along those lines. And then it turns out it was your mom seeing you for the first time after you've been shredded by a grizzly. Um, that again, that's the whole, the whole familial, the, the, the family seeing in distress. That's to me, some of the toughest things to read about because that whole emotional connection. Um, and, and, and so that was, that was really Hitting, and I mean that was even before your your wife got there, which was the next part that was just for me quite emotional. Her wanting to see you, even though you're in a such a state of um, that they didn't want her to see you. Um, but yeah, so so your mom, uh, she. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to jump in there, but that to me was nope. one of the again one of the really emotional parts. So the so that after. Do we need, do we need to take a, a break for a minute? Are you, no, are you running out of battery? Yeah, I'm just wondering why my plug's not working. 
Oh, there he goes. Okay. <laughs> I had to do that too. I, I saw, I'm like, oh, where, where is it? Because I'm not in my office at the moment. Uh, there was someone else. I share it with someone. So I, I came, jumped to a, a spare office to do this podcast. But um, there will be minor technical difficulties. That's all part of the doing podcast. Yeah. So the family, the, the, you're now at the hospital. Your whole family made it there, um, or a good portion of your family made it there before you got there, correct? Correct. And they were all waiting for me. Uh, I believe my wife was out, she was coming home from work or a function and the RSMP called her and said, you know, look, uh, your husband was involved in a bear mauling, um, <coughs> blah, blah, blah. He's on his way to the hospital and that's all I can report on. Yeah. I remember her saying that she was very devastated getting that phone call. I mean, I mean, who wouldn't be right? Yeah. No kidding. So, uh, so they, Brought me into the back, and there was a the emergency doctor was there right away. Uh, I remember they Jamie was talking to the doctor and letting him know my uh, you know heart rate and blood pressure. I guess it was pretty much perfect, you know, seventy eight over one twenty and like seventy four beats a minute. And he's like, wow. no, that can't be right. So yeah, he checked it a few times and finally he's like, okay, whatever, that's it is it is what it is. <laughs> and he's asking like, what happened and. Jamie was trying to tell me, like, don't talk, you know, just, so he started talking. The doctor says, can he talk? He goes, yeah. Okay, we'll let him speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at this so, point, how, how are you, so your jaw was broken in multiple places, right? And it was dislocated. Now you've put it back into place. So everything works, functions well enough to be able to talk. Not, not really like uh, how we're talking now, but enough that you can understand. Yeah. And, and I mean, your lips are also More shredded, muffled. right? Correct. So that while it, they were gone, it yeah. was just like my teeth. So how, you could, how did you, you could have, sorry, how, how did you drink through a straw without lips for suction? Oh, just squeezing it. I would squeeze the, okay. Okay. dump it in or squeeze it in. Yeah. 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 Um, so tell them the doctor what happened. You know, I got mauled by a bear. Tell them the story, what's going on. And, and, uh, and that, and then I said, I wanted to talk to my wife before we, before they did anything. And they said, okay, we're going to bring her in. I said, but you got to cover my face. Like, I'm not going to let her see me like this. So they brought her in. They had a, a towel over. And then I think the first thing I said to her was like, I'm sorry. You know, I, sorry, I got mauled by a bear and, and that I miss him. Um, it was a very quick, a very quick uh, conversation. And I didn't think I was going to make it through the surgery. Like I made it this far, but I was, I had a fear of going under and not waking up. Yeah. And so this was, I guess, kind of like a goodbye. And then she left and came back to the waiting room. And then uh, Jamie, the uh, EMT, I actually asked him if he could give my wife and and uh, my wife his number to contact him after. Just, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so when he left the room, the, the room to come out front and talk to my wife, he actually broke down in tears and was crying. And he couldn't speak to my mom or my wife at the time. He just was lost. And my wife and mom were like, what happened? Like, I just saw him two minutes ago. He was fine. Like, did he die? Like, what's going on? Yeah. So he broke down and and then uh, gave her my number and said, "No, no, he, this is he's fine." It just this is, it was really emotional for him because he said I was one of the worst people has ever dealt with. That actually was one hundred percent coherent and was able <laughs> to keep on a conversation. And I, it blows my mind that your blood pressure was and a heartbeat were where they should be after leaking blood for however many hours, hiking out, and it's pumping out of your body. That's, yeah, yeah. Un, that's crazy. I don't know what what saved me or you know why I'm still here today, but yeah, yeah. Oh, <clears throat> so the right after, right after. Um, talking to my wife they rushed me in for a cat scan and laying in the hospital bed I, you know i was pretty scared all by myself um at the whole point in time i had you know amanda tell sundry and then i had jamie there who 
and the other doctor that was holding my head the whole time. So I felt comfortable and safe. Uh, but this was now just porters and nurses pushing me around and sitting there waiting for, you know, the CAT scan or CT scans. So during that process, one of the doctors came up to me, and a lady, and she held my hand and she told me what was going to happen and put me through this. And I told her not to leave me. And all I can remember is she had green eyes. And I just, because she's right in my face and I could see that she had green eyes. So I always thought of her as the green eyed, green eyed girl. And um, so I put me through the CT scans and everything else. She held my hand pretty much the whole time. We got into the, uh, the uh, surgery room and they had me in the surgery room. Uh, there was a, it sounded like an Aussie guy in there and he's, I was telling him, you know, I was pretty scared. They're giving me some fluids to pouring fluids down, um, kind of like charcoal or like a. It's know, to like stop you from puking, like a, isn't it? It, it? It's like a charcoal mixture to absorb anything that could be left in your stomach. I, I only know this because I've had a friend that went through a bad incident and they wanted to suck everything out of his stomach. But I, I, I don't know. Is that kind of what they were doing? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's like a, I don't know. It tasted like charcoal, kind of gross. And yeah. they're giving it to me. I'm like, oh, this is like drinking Jack Daniels or something. I made a comment. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, <clears throat> uh, it was you know, I was scared and they give me this stuff. And I remember this Aussie guy saying, don't worry, buddy, I'm right here. And he was rubbing my feet while they were <laughs> going to uh, knock me out. And uh, there was a brown eyed, a brown eyed doctor, a female doctor and a green eyed female doctor. One on each side, massaging my hands. And I had the Aussie guy at my feet. Well, he <laughs> sounded Aussie. And then the, they put a, a mask over me and uh, to count backwards. And I, Kind of passed out, but not really. I was wide awake for the whole surgery. Um, the doctor who put me together, Dr. Nickerson, he came in, oh, partway through. Because uh, at first they stitched my knee up and then my hand. Then he came in after. And I remember him talking to his group, his team there about what they're going to do. And he had a big beard, like he had like a biker's beard and these big thick glasses, uh, like not thick glasses, but thick rim glasses. Yeah. They were black. And I just remember his big beard. He looked like a biker and he was through the <laughs> surgery. Who's this badass remember, looking dude about to cut me off? Yeah. So and he's a, he's not a small guy either. He's probably the same height as me. Maybe ah, he's about the same height as me. He's a solid, he's a solid guy. Yeah. Uh, then. I just remember laying there and they had the light above me and I can't move. I could see my face, like parts of it. They're sewing it together. Um, that was, oh, that was not, it's like being on saw, I guess. They're like cutting you up, but you can't. <laughs> and you weren't under at this point or were you on your way? Were they about to put you under or what, what, no, what I, was going I was, on there? I think I was, well, I was supposed to be fully out, but I wasn't. I was still. Like, I remember, hearing. can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear oh. me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. I just I picked was... up the phone because there was, because someone was paging up here. Sorry. So I just oh, picked it okay. up and hung it up. Uh, I, I was fully under, but not. Like, oh, okay. I couldn't feel anything. I, I couldn't move, but I could see what's going on around me. Yeah. It's a, it's a very weird weird experience weird feeling i was in there i think i was 12 hours for the first surgery and the next day i'm in the, they moved me to icu and my whole family's there my wife was there a, a good friend of mine uh was also in the room when i woke up yeah. and of course the first thing you do when they woke when they uh try to wake me up i tried pulling out the tubes and everything and fighting with everybody because it's just shock and yeah um that's when things got real, real difficult, real tough, real scary, real fast. Um, every time I'd go to sleep or kind of drift off nightmares, you know, a bear's chewing on me. So I'd wake up flailing or, or um, just scared. 
totally dazed, not know where I am. That that was hard. And, you know, my wife and my good friend to be there and see me just totally lost. Waking up in terrors. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, that was tough. Uh, I mean, that's the first thing I remember. And, and I remember, too, after a couple hours of being awake, they'd come in and they asked me uh, how much pain I was in. You know, well, I'm missing lots of stuff, so obviously going to be a lot of pain. But they would ask me, and I, I would tell them, uh, you know, well, the pain is unbearable. And they're like, well, give me a number between, you know, 1 and 10, 10 being the worst pain you ever experienced and 1 being nothing. I said, well, it's it's unbearable. And they're like, um, we need a number between 1 and 10. I'm like, you know, unbearable. <laughs> and they're like, shut up. <laughs> Get the humor through it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, I was on some, obviously some wicked drugs. Uh, yeah. I had a, the first, that first day I had a, a doctor who, um, I'm not sure what ethnology was, but he was, he was brown. And I'm like, are you brown? Cause I could see, and I was, I could actually, you know, and it was, and I was my wife saying I was really it seemed like I was really high at the time. The doctor is really good about it. He goes, Yeah, I am. I'm here to help you, blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> I feel kind of bad today about it, but no, the doctor is pretty good. He's like, oh no, it's just the stuff he's on. He's fine. Uh, <laughs> but that, that was like the, the first day, the first the first night was really, really tough. Uh the flashbacks and nightmares were horrendous. Um my good friend is a, a social worker, so he one of the first things he did when I got there was he would <clears throat> massage my feet. That was just like the only part of me that didn't have any damage to it was my feet. And <clears throat> when I come out of surgery, my whole left arm was in a cast or in like a foam cast all the way up to my shoulder. My right leg was in a cast up, up to my hip. My fingers on both hands where or my on my right hand was completely covered so you can see you can only see one of my fingers sticking out of the bandage and on my left hand you can only see my pinky sticking out with a big rod because it was all broken and shattered yeah uh, i didn't think i had any fingers at all uh i thought i was missing my right leg because i couldn't feel it i couldn't move it i there was nothing there wow <coughs> So having the nightmares, uh, my uh, good friend, he would be at the end of the bed and he would massage my one foot. My left foot is the only thing that didn't have damage. And he'd be, or the tips of my toes on my right, and he'd be, you're in a safe place. You know, it's okay. You're you're safe now. And he showed my wife how to do that. And anybody that came into the room, he would just always, if he's having a nightmare, just do this. Just because it, just to train your body to get out of it. Yeah. Uh, after, during that day, or after that day, next day I got really pale and cold. I was complaining about being really cold, and I was pale and didn't look too well. My wife said, "He's not. I'm not looking." She, she was telling the doctor that he don't look very good. He's not. He's not okay. Mm -hmm. uh, she figured that we needed blood, and she said, "Like, you know, do, like, do we need to give him blood or anything?" Uh, and the nurses they end up getting one unit of blood. And I, I guess I perked right up after I got my color back and I felt better. Uh, and then they, soon after that, they took me away and I went for round number two for fixing my face. <laughs> and and so uh, I was in for another 12, 13 hours. They stapled my ear back on. Um, and this is the, the day first, after? Like, this is only 48 hours or so since, right? This this would be, uh, yeah, uh, day three, okay. this would be the third yeah. day in hospital. Yeah. Uh, the the first the first uh, surgery they put in on new eye sockets and steel eye sockets, fixed a lot of the bone and put most of my skin back on and part yeah. of my ear. Uh, the second surgery they did more work to my face, my ear, uh, back of my head. They kind of tightened everything up, kind of adjusted it, trying to make me look as pretty as possible without seeing a before picture of me right yeah <laughs> so then they uh took me in after that surgery they took me into uh 
uh, Unit 33, the burn unit in the Foothills Hospital. Well, no more in ICU, just had a room. They moved me into with somebody right away. I remember my sister was really mad at him, my younger sister, and she was like, he needs to be in his own room. He can't have this. I, you know, I was having flashbacks all the time. And yeah. uh, so they ended up moving me to a private room. And then from there, we had to have somebody with me 24-7 just because of the flashbacks. Uh, waking up in tears and trying to get that under control. And uh, I wasn't, I didn't have any strength to sit up, to move around, move my hands, nothing. I was basically a vegetable just laying there and uh, I had to be fed. I don't think I ate the first four days being in there. I don't think I ate anything at all. Wow. Uh, um, I don't think I was expected to make it that long. I think everybody was kind of, wasn't sure it was kind of touch and go yeah and so uh, were you on an iv like were they feeding you through an iv up until then or not at all not at all no i had an iv for uh for pain meds and uh any um in stuff for infections yep and then i had a catheter and that was really it everything else it was just pain and antibiotics is, is all they were Pretty shooting into you yeah keeping you alive yeah the, yeah, the bare minimum. <laughs> yeah, bare minimum. <laughs> so, I like I think it was like the fourth night or fifth night. My older brother was there, with my there and my wife uh, and my daughter, and they had like this applesauce stuff that they were using to feed my daughter. And so, yeah. uh, I was hungry, and I was. They uh, squirted some of that in my mouth, and I was like, "Oh, this is really good." So my, I remember my brother went to the Safeway and went like bought a whole case of it, come back, and he was just like feeding me, <laughs> just like consuming <laughs> everything in sight. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't really open my mouth, uh, my jaw. Everything was not wired shut, but uh, so stiff and kind of like locked in place. Like it only had about yeah. like a fingers width I could open it. Anything oh, okay. with a straw, so I was sucking things back. Um, so was yeah, the bone then, itself not broken, like the jawbone? Was it all intact? Just, it was all intact, just uh, all just the muscles dislocated. From, yeah, and all the muscles from up in my side, my face were ripped off on the one side. So yeah, they gotcha. So, yeah. Uh, so then uh, every morning, my wife would get there early in the morning to be able to feed me, you know, the porridge or try to feed me what I could because I couldn't. I couldn't even sit up. Yep. That was the first week. And one day I, she got there late and the porter got the food and set me up with a tray. And I remember I got the button on the bed and was able to push it with my one hand and got it up. And I was leaning over the tray with my face kind of stuck right in there and just trying to slurp up the, <laughs> slurp up <laughs> my little porridge. I was so excited <laughs> for it. And my wife walked in and she's like, oh my God, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm just, <laughs> trying to eat <laughs> <laughs> on my own little independence here a little bit yeah it, you know with her with our with our uh, daughter trying to look after that coming to the hospital it was very overwhelming for her so uh between her and my good friend my mom and my older sister they did chips so she yep. was always there for me yeah that went on for probably the first two weeks and then um and it was just my wife, and she would take break. She would have some of her own time because you know this was very hard on her to see me like this. And uh, reading and her, was, reading her journal, which is very brave of her to be able to put that into the book because it's so personal. What a person writes in a journal, and so there's quite a few excerpts. And, and I want to say she kind of does one per day uh, for for a chunk of time while you're in there, and seeing her emotional ups and downs is tough and the struggles that she went through and um, wanting to put herself in your positions. And, and I mean, some, 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 some dark moments that she experienced um, just not on your behalf, but in wanting, wanting to be able to see what it was like, to, what you went through and then trying to uh, see, I don't even know how to put it without actually rereading it, which we're not going to do at, at this point, but it's, it's very brave of her to put her, 
journal entries in there. And, and again, this is one of those things that I'll say, buy the book and you can uh, see what she went through and, and read that. But it's, it's, it's quite emotional. And um, it just shows how strong her love for you and, and, and her dedication to you. I mean, she struggles with the whole, um, are we going to be able to make it through this as a couple? And anytime there's something major that occurs in a relationship like this, there's people that don't make it through or, and, and she was just so fortunate that you didn't, um, there was no brain damage and you were still the same person after the fact, even though you've been through this crazy emotional and physical event, you were still the same person inside. And so, I mean, reading her get into the in, in intricacies of, of what's going on in her head and the daily struggles that she had was, is pretty, pretty tough and pretty emotional. So. Um, kudos to her to be able to let those feelings become public like that. Yeah, it's, it's a very good read and it's a very tough read. I really struggle reading through it. I haven't read it all hundred percent fully all the way through. I just bits and pieces cause it's, for me, it's really tough. It's, she's yeah. a wonderful woman. Yeah. Uh, getting back to the whole PTSD and waking up in night terrors, is that something you still deal with today or how long did that last before it kind of phased out? Uh, it never really phased out. The uh, last year, about April, I got into a program, uh, ART, uh, it was exhilarated rapid. Oh, the nickname is ART and it's okay. for PTS, PTSD. It was, one of my, when I was in the hospital, that's the first thing I asked for was help um, because of the night terrors. And I wanted yep. help right away because, you know, that's, that's tough. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't until last year, about April, I actually got in to see a, a, a therapist for ART, decided to give it a try. And the first eight hour or the first session was 45 minutes. I was able to sleep eight hours that night, no problems. And I haven't had eight hours of sleep in the three and a half years after the attack. Wow. Like I'd wake up four or five times at night. I'd have them during the day. I yeah. woke up in my backyard underneath my deck in the middle of the winter time, crawling away from a bear, um, you know, falling down the stairs and having, having flashbacks while I'm walking down the stairs and falling down. Um, I remember a few times of, you know, tossing and turning and having the flashbacks and knocking myself out on the, like the nightstand. And, um, <clears throat> it, it was a constant, constant worry for my wife, like constantly. Uh, if I fell asleep on the couch, if she would to wake me, if uh, she would have touched me on my shoulders or anything, I would freak right out and go straight into a flashback. Yeah. Uh, She'd have to squeeze my feet and wake me up that way. Yeah. Um, my daughter being really young, you know, a year or two years old, of course you're sleeping. She'd run over and want to play or jump on you or, you know, play with her dolls on you. And a few times I've woken up and flailing my wife trying to hold me down. Cause you know, I'm wanting me to hit my daughter and at that part, right. that's, that's the roughest part. Yeah. Yeah, the recovery and and moving forward after what you went through. Yeah, the the nightmares. I'm glad they ended. I only had two in the last oh, at least eighteen months, okay. and they were super light. Uh, my wife told me like a couple times that I've tossed and turned and started making noises, and usually she jumps up right away and wakes me up. I squeeze my feet, but yep. she said I went away pretty quick. I don't. I don't recall any of them to the last, yeah. but she said twice she thought she was pretty certain I was, but it wasn't severe enough for her to wake me up. Okay. And even so after the ART, I was playing a hunting game with my daughter and we we're running through, it was like deer hunter, Cabela's big game hunter and yeah. running through hunting caribou. And all of a sudden this grizzly bear jumps on you. And my wife was, she saw it and she's like, uh Oh, Cause you know, like waiting for me to jump into a, a flashback. She was yeah. com completely scared and didn't know what to do. And she kind of really monitored me. And then uh, we played that round and got a little bit further in the game. And then I just turned it off and 
that was it. That night, my wife stayed up all night long because she knew it was going to be an awful night, but I never had any nightmares. It, I was, it was super surprising. Yeah. The so ART, it, so like, you slept through the night, even after that. Even after that. And I told my therapist about it and she was like, really? I'm like, yeah. I mean, I couldn't even look at a bear before and I'd get a flashback. Now I'm able to play a video game with a bear attacking me and not yeah. have, not have it excite me or. Well, that's excellent that the treatment was working. It was, you know, I did three sessions and wow, what a life changer. Like what definitely a life changer. So did you find after that attack, I mean, with such physical, um, physical attacks and, ch and, and changes to your body, did you have any long-term changes, uh, I want to say physiologically, are, are, are you the same person, and, and I don't mean because you've been through an attack, but did it affect your nervous system or anything like that be after the attack? Did you come out um, more emotional or anything like that? Uh, no, emotional-wise, still pretty much the same person. I don't think okay. I've changed. Yep. Uh, physically, well, my eyes don't close. So this is, uh, we mean the eyes close. So Okay. My yeah. eyelids don't fully, fully close. close. Yeah. Uh, it's hard for me to close my eyes independently, but now I can. It makes okay. it a little bit easier to hunt or to be able to yeah. see the bull again. My pinky on my left hand is uh, well, it's still there, but it sticks out. So if I go to grab anything, it'll stick out. And gotcha. it's hard for me to bend it in, so I, I'd have to yeah. you know, close it. Uh, the tendons in my right leg, all of them severed. So I got a brace I'm supposed to wear lots, or unless I keep my legs in good shape, like yep. ride my bike, do lots of walking. Yeah. Helps uh helps them. There's still quite a few challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. I, yeah. Uh a lot of a lot of hard work and physio physiotherapy has helped me overcome a lot of them. I, yep. I don't have feeling in my left hand and my fingertips on both hands, my left leg. I don't have feeling in spots, whole yep. left side of my face. Don't have feeling top of my head. It's in, it's in spots. Okay. Uh, it, to this day, I still like to be able to take a shower and be able to feel your hands running through your hair, but I, it's spotty. Yeah. Like if you wore, it's like if you wore a helmet in the shower and try to wash your hair and you just can't feel it. it right. It's, you don't miss it until it's gone. No kidding. Yeah. So to this day, that's still, I would like to have that feeling again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and the only reason I ask that is, again, just with talking to Robbie Austin about his um, mauling. And I think it was more because he, it, it punctured an artery in his, in his uh, neck and he had a little bit of a stroke. But he said, basically, he's not more emotional um he's not more emotional but he cries when he talks about things without even thinking about it. like he's like i don't feel like i'm tearing up but just the tears are running down my face and he says so don't don't be alarmed if we're talking about this and then i i, I start to cry because i'm not i'm fine talking about it but he said there, there are definitely changes that have occurred physiologically with after his attack that that he says it's just it's what he now lives with and it's it didn't change him as a person it's just he's noticed some changes with his how his body reacts a, a after the mauling as well how how long were you in the hospital before you were able to go home uh five weeks and eight hours and 23 minutes i think <laughs> you got that nailed <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah it was only five weeks uh it, when I first was in there, they figured it'd be early November or late November to early December before I was able to get out. Just yeah, just from what I endured. Once I was able to stand up and move around, I recovered a lot quicker. Okay. Uh, I think it was around week three when I was able to actually walk more than, you know, 60, 70 feet. I was walking around the unit with a walker. Okay. Uh, Today, if I were to walk around the unit, it'd probably take me 35, 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. 
back then when I started to walk around, it'd probably take me half a day just to walk around the unit in a walker. Yeah. But I'd eat in the morning, get on the walker, walk around the unit, eat lunch, walk around the unit, go to bed. Wow. That was that was my daily routine. So every day I try to walk around that unit as many times as possible. Yeah. Just to keep going. And that really excelled. Uh, near the near the end of September, they decided to uh, try to close up the wound on my head. Now yeah. on the right side, the well the half or half of my head on the right side is was all exposed, uh, bone in the two big divots, and okay. then there was some plate that wasn't covered up. That there was still exposed bone, and on a daily basis they remove the bandages, clear up the bone, and rebandage it up. So they they decided that they were going to try to move a portion of my head over top of the exposed bone. They took me in for a surgery for that. That didn't work. The part of my head started to die. It wasn't getting enough blood flow. So they moved it back and then took a chunk out of my inner thigh to cover up the exposed bone as a temporary fix. Now, when I woke up from that surgery, the doctor came in and he's like, so we put skin over top of the bone. Usually there's tissue and blood flow there. So we don't expect this to uh, to take. Like It might, might not. Right. Uh, he gave it, I think it was like a 10% chance of it adhering to the bone. And then yep. an extra 2% because I got mauled by a grizzly bear. Because I had grizzly DNA now. <laughs> that, that might work. <laughs> it, <laughs> and so I was like, okay, you know, like, what's the next step? He says, well, we'll see how that does. What we might have to do is take an artery out of your neck and run it, or a vein out of your neck and run it into the area and then move another piece of your uh, head over to cover it up. Well, it, it actually ended up taking and And uh, so that's I mean, your inner thigh it. on that side there. And it took. Correct. Yep. And it took. So that's with the. Amazing. Uh, they could fix it. He's, he was bugging me about, uh, you know, maybe putting some tissue expanders in and then moving my hair around to cover it all up. And I said, no, nah, I like it better this way. I get half price haircuts. So. <laughs> Perfect. Keep it light. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always on the bright yeah. side. That's excellent. The, the doctor, Dr. Nickerson was a really, it was a really cool doctor. Uh, it was the after surgery, the next day after the surgery, when they put the skin graft on over top of the the bone there, uh, my buddies took me out to the to the shooting range, and I really wanted to go out and try shooting a gun just to see if I can actually hit anything. Uh, yeah. I was to the point now where I could the way I could see and focus on, be able to focus this, on things. Is, is this the picture in the book of you? I want to say with an AR or something at the range. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on a tripod. So I wasn't able to actually mm -hmm. hold up the gun. So we had it on a tripod for me to shoot. Yeah. And you know what? Wasn't shooting all day. And I was able to hit a target at 50, I don't know how far is it, like 50 meters, maybe, or 50, maybe 50 yards. Okay. So I had I had this target and I was so happy. And I remember coming up to the unit and I was kind of waddling into the unit. Um, and the charge nurses, I had a day pass that day. So I was late checking in too. So I walk <laughs> past the nurse counter and the charge nurse is like, where were you? Well, I was at the gun range. Look, I can hit something. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, what do you mean you're at a gun range? Oh, I went to a gun range and was shooting guns all afternoon. She goes, in your condition with a head injury? So <laughs> <laughs> You probably wouldn't want to shoot like a 50 cal or something that's going to have that percussion to, sh to rattle the brain, but... <laughs> I was shooting a 308, uh, 30-odd six, and a 300 win in, okay. indoors, Yeah, which is not a, not a good idea, but... No. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it wasn't bad on, on your system? It didn't want to shut you down or anything? No, it was, I was good. I remember walking into the range. I had the, my uh, backpack. It looked like a guitar pack <laughs> with yep. my gun, gun yep. in it, and I'm walking in... Yep. Yeah, and I walk into the range. I had a neck gaiter over top of my uh, bandage on my head, and I had yeah. the drains hanging down on my neck from the wounds, <laughs> and I'm just hobbling in there. And I remember the guy at the desk is like, "What are you here for? I'm here to shoot." And I'm cross-eyed as a bat too at this time. And <laughs> he's like, "Can you actually see the target?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's over there somewhere." And just he didn't know what to do, and so he got me set up, and it was a lot of fun. 
when I so when I got back, the charge nurse she was so mad at me. She's like, "Go to your room." So I'm like, "Okay, whatever." So I go to my room, hang up my hang up my uh, target. I was so proud I could hit something. Yeah. She 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 called the doctor, and uh, Doctor Nickerson come in there, and he's you know he's, so how was shooting? I said, "Oh, it was awesome. I was able to hit stuff." You know, it was a good feeling. He goes, how was your head? I said, never better. Like, doesn't hurt or anything? I said, nope. And he goes, well, that's good on you for getting out there and doing that. Have a good night. Perfect. <laughs> and the nurse was so mad. She's like, that's it? Like. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, you, you mentioned your vision was, was was still terrible at that point. How's your vision now? My vision is, is, is good. Uh, it's 2023. The problem I have is my eyes water so much and I don't have any tear ducts. They tried putting them in twice now and it didn't work. My yeah. eyes just water. When I look down, they fill up with water in it and I look like I'm crying. So the biggest struggle that I got now was able to close my eyes partially independently. I could shoot my bow. I've yeah. been doing lots of bow hunting. Uh, but for the most part, pretty good. Knowing from what you know what happened yep and what was it like getting back into the back country and how long did it take before you step foot back in the outdoors <laughs> 48 hours <laughs> <laughs> i was out of the hospital the, as soon as i could put pants on over top of the uh skin graft i was back out it was 48 hours after being out of the hospital i drove back to panther river resort yeah and uh Saw the ladies there that helped me in Raiden. We drove up as a group to the gate, which I made the stupid mistake of crawling underneath. Yeah. We took our photos there. And then uh, leaving there, we saw some uh, spruce grouse running around. So I got out with a shotgun, and me and my wife went out, and we and I shot one of them. She shot the other one. And, <laughs> and I think it was probably three days after that, I was out hunting uh, with another friend where I shot a, a white-tailed doe and a small bull elk. <laughs> what was that so, like getting back out into the bush? I, I was excited for it. I was ready. Like I just yeah. had all, all this built up inside. I just wanted to get out and yeah. run wild again. But no fear? No, no flashbacks I, when you get, got back out there? No, I was fine for the most part. I still struggled a little bit being near trees. If I was yeah. with my wife or daughter, I had a struggle with being in the bush, but by myself, it wasn't, wasn't that bad. Yeah. I think it was three weeks after the incident, we went back into the same area. Uh, I wanted to go sheep hunting again, so I found somebody that would go out with me, and we ended up running into uh, Sal and two cubs on the trail. Same, and same area? Same area, and uh, he wasn't. He he was a little nervous, and so we decided to head out and head somewhere else. But I I kind of wanted to go back and like I really wanted to get a sheep. It was my year. It was my time. Yep. I just didn't want to give up. Yeah, yeah. And did uh, was your wife fairly accepting of you wanting to go back out sheep hunting and getting back into the mountains? No, she dreaded every single second of it. We I had a. Uh, we had a list of rules that we had to, I had to follow. So I had to get a Garmin outreach, in reach, in reach, and uh, check in with her every hour or so yeah. with that. Do the live tracking so she can keep track of me and yeah. Uh, always had to be with somebody. Yeah. So there's a whole list of whole list of rules, and I abide yeah. by them because otherwise it wasn't logical. Uh, fair enough. And and what are your thoughts on? The fatal flaws that were made that day that I'm guessing that entire list is correcting. If you had advice for anyone else going out into the backcountry, what what were the flaws that you made that you wouldn't make again? The biggest one would be bear spray, having it accessible. Um, now I keep it on my chest at all times. Actually, the year before I got mauled in the yep. same area, I got charged by a grizzly on a different ridge. And I had the pepper spray on my chest. The bear was, well, 30 yards away. And I come over a hill, and it was right there, and I surprised it. I, was, I saw a mule deer cutting across the side of the, or over top of the mountain. So I decided to cut around the mountain to cut him off. 
And I was jogging. I come over a little ridge, and there's a little, a little dip, and there's a big bear, big grizzly bear there. And I come over fast on him, and he he came up and charged me, and I sprayed him. He stopped at ten feet, and and then I took off and managed to get managed to. He went one way, I went the other way, but the bear yeah. spray stopped him. Uh, so the biggest mistake that I made is not having my bear spray on me and accessible. Like yeah. that, I don't think if I had a gun in my hand on both of them, I don't think I would have been able to stop it. There's no way. Uh, even laying there, when the bear's chewing on me, I had a knife on my hip, but I never even went for it, nothing. Like, I don't, I honestly don't think any of that would have helped. Right. Yeah. I've I've heard that numerous times that bear spray is your number one protection against a bear attack. Uh, you don't have to be as precise with it. You might get sprayed yourself in in the process, but there's a, if you can get that plug out and hit the bear with it, it's it's disappearing. Um, whereas with a gun, you have to be precise and on target. And you've got a long barrel. Normally, you're not. We're not packing pistols here in Canada, um, so. Even packing a pistol, like if you, if you, I don't know if you ever hunted in Africa and, and, uh, hunted dangerous game or been with a guy that hunts dangerous game, they, yes, they use a large caliber weapon, but they don't shoot until that animal is literally going to gore them. They yeah. wait till, you know, the, the rhino or the yeah, elephants literally touching them before they shoot. Yeah. Uh, and they do brain shots. Now, I don't know about doing a brain shot on a bear with a, <laughs> with a scope running at you. I, I don't know. I don't have no. that big of balls. <laughs> no, no. Bear spray is the number one thing. Like, I think you'd hit it on the head. And then an inReach is really cheap insurance. If you've spent the money to get out and get into the backcountry, you look at your gun, your tent, your backpack, all the gear you've got on you. I don't want to think about how much I've got in just camo and hunting gear set of binoculars you add it up what's that extra i mean for what is it 350 bucks you can get the in reach minis the base models pick a used one up it doesn't matter and then you can just buy it a month subscription you don't have to have it running all year long it's cheap insurance and it's it's that peace of mind i uh i got one a couple of years ago now and I've, I've been running it for two to three seasons and it it came in handy last year when we had a, a family incident uh, i was in the bush I, I, I was day two of my sheep, a sheep hunt up north, and it was a two day drive and then an eight hour boat ride. Get to camp, uh, turn on the inReach to send out the we're at camp message just every night, same message, all good, back yeah. at camp, talk to you tomorrow, basically. And then the inReach just goes boom, ba boom, 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 just message, message, message coming in. Um, the day that I got there, my son ended up in the hospital. And so it was just, and it was, it was COVID. He ended up on oxygen in the hospital with COVID and he's 18 months old at the time. And so oh, just to have that, I mean, it was, I, by the next morning, my wife's like, you don't have to come out. Um, he's back at home. We're doing better. But just having that and being able to make decisions. And then she had the peace of mind every day that all good, all good. We're, we're out here on the mountain. It really is cheap insurance. And Robbie Austin, I mean, he's a huge push uh, for Garmin in reaches. And every year he buys a couple and donates them at every Wild Sheep Society event or whatever he's going to. Um, because that was one of his fatal flaws is they had an inReach on them, but they were 40 yards apart. And Chris had it on his body. And after the mauling, Robbie couldn't crawl over to get it. And he thought he was going to die there. But Chris ended up was in better condition. And he's like, I won't go into the back country without an inReach on me. He says, even if I'm, he lives out in the country, even if I'm going to get firewood, I throw that in inReach right where I can grab it. He says, other people will put it in their bag. Another fatal flaw. You yeah. leave it where you can grab it and you can hit your SOS button or you can message out if you need to. So bear spray and an inReach, I would, uh, are, are the two big takeaways for sure that the bear spray could stop the mauling. The inReach could get you the help really quickly. Well, quicker yeah. than, than than what you had to endure. <laughs> quicker than walking out. <laughs> <laughs> well, like what I what I do now is I take a uh, Badlands Bino uh, holder, and I have yep. the bear spray on one side, and then the in reach on the other side. Well, so anytime I'm scouting, even fishing, I normally have my binoculars on. Got yep. those two together, it works great, and I and I practice. Yeah. One of the one of the things I do now when I take old friends or the wife 
out in the backcountry, we always stop before we go and discuss uh, what we're going to do if we see a bear. And we practice spraying our bear spray uh, by the fake the fake cans, yep. aerosol cans. And we yep. practice with them, and I show everybody how to use it. And one of the other biggest things is if when you have your can of bear spray and, you know, you end up falling down, you get in the fetal position, you take your can of bear spray and, like, you put it behind your neck. So if a bear comes to chew on your neck, the can will go explode. You're going to get some, but you're yeah. going to survive. Wow. Just little tricks like that. Or yeah. if uh, if you spot a bear, the person spotting the bear looks, watches the bear, and the other guy grabs him and guides him through the bush backwards. The one person is always watching with the bear spray ready. Makes Simple sense. Simple stuff, but yeah, things that you probably don't think about in the at the time, but if you rehearse it, you're more likely to remember it. We do the same thing with avalanche training on snowmobiles. Beginning of every season, we go through those procedures about what if, what if, how do we do this? Let's test our gear. And I mean, that that makes perfect sense. And that's great advice for everyone listening to go over those scenarios. Anyone you're going hiking with, hunting with, camping with, have a contingency, contingency plan ready for an attack. Definitely. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Unbelievable. I'm just I'm I'm just running it all through my head. There's there's one part right after the attack that you uh touched on but I didn't want to interrupt you to dig into it then. I thought I'd wait till the end that as small as it was as small as the the description of it was in the book, it's one of the things that's really um really emotional, really powerful. And you, you, like I say, you touched on it in our discussion here, and it had to do with right after the mauling there in the book, there was a, just a short paragraph where you talked about the possibility of why am I suffering? I could end the pain. And um, uh, again, that was, that was one of those spots I had to stop reading and go back and reread it and put myself in your position. And then the whole um thinking about your wife and your daughter and and it it hit me hard it really hit me hard and it was it's t- like i say it's touched on it's about a half a paragraph uh i i i want to say like on page i 38 or something like that it like cuz i stopped <laughs> yeah. i i stopped and i had to kind of go back start over and read those last couple paragraphs and it was it it, it was a tough read and i can fully understand after what you've been through you see how far of a hike you have out I, you might have even this might have been even after the first tumble I, I don't remember exactly at what point but man it's 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 emotional it's impactful and as a father and as a husband it's 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 tough to read but well worth reading let's put it that way and it really puts everything into perspective of what you endured and how hard and what pushed you to make it out of there but without let me paint you a picture without giving too many details here just imagine yourself after being mauled sitting on on what you think is one of the most peaceful areas you've ever been one of the most beautiful places it just gives you a sense of safety and just all around beauty and just yeah. sitting there knowing blood everywhere your face scattered across the hillside and just what do you do in that situation? Like, you know, it's the end. Do you, yeah. what do you do? That's, that was probably the hardest three minutes or so, or 10 minutes of, of really like determining if I was going to be here or not. That no was kidding. very hard to, and it's even hard to talk about. That's part of the reason why it's a small paragraph in the book, but that was a huge step. Um, hard to describe um like you know it's the end you know there's no way you're gonna ever get out um uh, you know things are just so messed up what do you do and it, it yeah i'm glad i did because i'm here today it, it, for sure yeah and and yeah sitting in that position i could like you say you paint the picture there the hopelessness of what you've just been through and 
the challenge ahead of you, it's it definitely would have been the easier way out, right? But it, when, <laughs> when you're when you're sitting there and just you know you feel that nice nice cool breeze whip down, you can hear there's a creek nearby, and you can hear the water trickling over the rocks, kind of down the falls. Just a nice peaceful, you know, like this is people were buy CDs to listen to this the sound yeah. and it's all yeah. around you and you're just sitting there and it's like a little oasis, but you're, I don't know. It, it's a out of body experience, I guess. And just, I don't know. It's really hard to put that emotion on paper and unless yeah. you've been through it. Yeah. But I can feel the struggle from, like I say, it was so short, but so impactful. And I, I, I can feel the internal struggle in that just, putting myself through what you had been through. And, and I mean, the book is very vivid. Um, your recollection of the attack goes into detail and it's, it's really easy to lose yourself in the story. Um, and so I, 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 again, to be able to see the raw emotion that, that you put down on paper, um, a lot of people may have skipped over that because that's a difficult thing to talk about. It's a difficult thing to, to even, it's vulnerable to put out there that that was a thought that went through your head and stuff too, right? I mean, everyone wants to see the, oh, the heroic story. And you touch on that in there as well, that people thought of you as a hero and you're like, I'm not a hero. Heroes rescue other people and to have that struggle as well. So, I mean, you, you really left it all out there for the reader to go through as did your wife. And I, I commend that because it really would have been easy to leave those things out. And so um, I don't know if there's anything Anything else from the book or from the story that you want to get out there for listeners to um, take away? I, I mean, for me, the big one is get out there and buy the book. It's not available yet. It will be available. Are there, do you have, where are you selling it? Well, um, I hope uh, we'll sell it with you guys. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to put it online. You'll be able to buy it on our website. As soon as we get some in, we'll put it online and you, you can order it here. Uh, you're, you're hitting local hunting stores across Canada or mom and pa shops across Canada. Uh, mostly bookstores. There are some awesome. uh, sporting goods stores. They'll be carrying it. We don't have the yep. full list quite yet. They're still, uh, still trying to get it out there, yep. uh, but it'll be chapters. Indigo. You can also Perfect. get it online on yep. Amazon. And also directly from Rocky Mountain Books. Okay. You can order it on their website. Excellent. And they'll be available September 27th. So getting excited. No kidding. Yeah. And uh, anything else you want the listeners to hear before we before we wrap up this podcast? Uh sure. No, I think we well, covered that, most of it. That's awesome. I Can't mean, the story is, <laughs> this was a two and a half hour podcast. We got through a good chunk of your story. There's a lot that was left out, which is great because that gives the reader something to look forward to in the book. It's just like reading a book and watching a movie. We just watched the movie here on this podcast and buy the book because it gets a lot more in depth and a lot more emotional. Um, my business partner and Uncle Tim just popped in. I'm actually sitting in his office, and he wanted to he wanted to say hi. Hey, Jeremy. Hey. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> You're running through my earphones, but it's an honor. Thank you. I don't Thank you. Nice that. meeting you. Thank you very much. It's an honor. We sure appreciate you uh, taking the time and uh, doing this with us. Um, you know, I think there's some things people can learn from your story and gain and, you know, some safety things potentially. I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard the story. I'm sure Aaron's going to fill me in and I really look forward to seeing it. But it's great to be talking to you. And again, thank you. We're, we're honored. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. This is exciting. Can't hear a word you said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard it. <laughs> he heard it. Good meeting you. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> so, well, and I... I think we only covered like what the first 45 pages of the book <laughs> and there's 192 more to go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're the, no, it's a, that's where all the juicy stuff is. Yeah. Any, anything else you do want to touch on in, in the story or anything? Uh, you know, some of the biggest takeaways from it is, uh, you know, family comes first. Uh, don't, don't take things for granted. And uh, it's all about setting 
many goals. When you set many goals, you can achieve the most incredible things. Uh, you know. And and I guess yeah, that 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 is what we forgot to get into is let's go back to the title of this book, Mauled Lessons Learned from a Grizzly Bear Attack. So there's some <laughs> of the lessons. There's the takeaways. <laughs> There's still, there's still a lot more lessons. And also this book is a tribute to the power of the human spirit and the drive to survive. Not only is it about a vis vicious bear attack, but it's about the life lessons learned along the way. Uh, you know, the book will captivate the reader and immerse them in a world of emotions. Uh, the other good thing about the book is it's written from several different views. Uh, in Fish and Wildlife, my wife, uh, the the other heroes throughout the story that shared the epic journey with me, it, yep. it gives you a wide range of. And, well, and I don't, I don't think you need to push the book. The book book pushes itself and this story that you, you just shared with us on this podcast, which will go live here on Thursday. Uh, we'll be promoting it and stuff uh, leading up to the release of the podcast. And I'll, I'll let you know how that all goes. And, and if there's anything down the road that we can help you out with, with promotions, or if you're ever going around doing book signings or anything like that, I mean, um, we're here, we're here. We want to help get your story out there. We want to help, help you out in any way we can to get this story out there because it is a story worth reading and worth, worth listening to. It's phenomenal. And I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to sit down with us to go through this and to share the firsthand experience. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. I'd love to. I'd love to make a trip out there and do a big book signing for you guys. That'd be that'd be a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, we could hit you at both locations. We could do uh, one here in Dawson, and then hit the big our new location in Prince George, and see what we can do. Let's have some fun with it. Find find a downtime when you're willing to do a little traveling and do the loop. Definitely. We'll Excellent. Well. So if anyone else out there has a story that they think is worth sharing, whether it's uh, an attack, whether it's a harrowing outdoor story, please reach out to me, Aaron at Corlanes.com. Shoot, shoot us a message on Instagram, Facebook. If you are looking to get a hold of Jeremy, he is also on Facebook and Inst you're on Instagram as well. Correct. Jeremy Evans. Uh, I will be posting a link when we push this on social media. So they'll, I'll be resharing your post promoting the book which also has the very graphic photograph if they want to see kind of the aftermath at which point i <laughs> at which point in the maulings was that photo taken was that between the second, second and, and third, third round so yeah. after the third round you were even worse than than that photograph there correct i was fully de-scalped so would, so everything from below my ears from the yep. back of my neck everything was pulled off i wow. looked like it looked like the guy off of uh, um, Captain America, the guy with the red head. Yeah, that's what I that's what I look like with the ball peen hammer smashed in my face. <laughs> Holy, unbelievable! Well, there you have it. That's that's the story, and I, I I can't wait to have a follow up discussion with you in a couple weeks and see kind of where we're at at that point once the book's live and available everywhere. All right, Jeremy. Um, I'm going to sign off. We can stay on and have a little follow-up discussion here, but signing off on the podcast, I can't thank you enough for sharing this with us. And, uh, yeah, if anyone else out there has stories that they feel are worth sharing in a podcast, we are now doing them over Skype as well. Initially up until this point, we were trying to have them in store, but living in Dawson Creek, we're not quite the most local place for everyone <laughs> to drive to, to have podcasts. So I think this went well. Um, it was, it, it, couple minor technical difficulties, but we look forward to having more podcasts like this. So reach out to us, Aaron at Corlanes.com. If you have someone or have a story you want to tell or reach out to your friends, if you think they would be good for a podcast guest as well. Hunt hard, talk free, signing off. Have a great day.